I stood at the edge of Pine Grove Forest, inhaling the scent of damp earth. My name is Lysander Seabrook, and I was part of an elite task force dedicated to hunting down terrifying creatures. We had received reports of mysterious disappearances and brutal killings happening on the outskirts of town, not far from where I stood. Our team's goal was to track down and eliminate whatever caused this havoc. I remember sharing a joke with my colleagues about how messy my room was, athemophobic quirk that somehow kept me relatable despite my dangerous profession. As we made our way deeper into the forest, we found evidence of the destruction caused by an unknown creature. Broken branches, claw marks on trees, shattered bones from previous victims. It all seemed very methodical and deliberate. We remained cautious, knowing full well we were close to finding out what manner of creature wreaked such havoc. The forestry department contained expert tracker named Oizen Merrick. Oizen noticed a particular pattern in the way the creature moved, a trail leading deeper into Pine Grove Forest. We followed it, ultimately reaching a clearing filled with remnants of something gruesome. A tattered jacket, blood-soaked leaves, mutilated body parts hinted at this creature's horrific nature. Gasps and low whispers echoed among us as we absorbed these brutal scenes. My initial skepticism faded away, replaced with icy dread as we realized just how serious this mission had become. Then we heard it. A low growling resonating through the nearby trees shook us to our core. We tightened our grips on weapons as we scanned the area for signs of danger. Our team leader, Perdita Finchley, motioned for us to spread out and flank whatever might charge at us from beyond our line vision. Abruptly, there it was, an imposing creature standing nine feet tall resembling a grotesque mix between man and beast emerged from behind gnarled tree trunks. Adrenaline surged through our veins as we raced to bring down this unparalleled monster. The creature had a hulking frame shrouded in matted fur. Its eyes blazed with predatory malice. Its wide, slavering jaws came together in rows of dagger-like teeth. It lunged viciously at one of our colleagues getting both of his arms ripped off his torso. The man choked on blood and screamed for aid that wouldn't come in time. We unleashed bullets on the beast, but it only appeared angered, unscathed, not unlike what we had heard in the accounts from frightened townspeople during our prior investigation. It retaliated with quick dispatch, eviscerating another teammate before we could react. I thought fast. We had to try something different if we wanted to survive this encounter. Confident in my quick-witted nature, I told the team to switch strategies, remove focus from firepower, and aim for immobilization instead. The monstrous being shifted its gaze to me next when I decisively shot at its legs. The sound that followed was blood-curdling. Anguish mixed with fury echoed around the trees as the creature found itself unable to attack us any further. We seized the opportunity and began closing in on our defeated foe. As the creature lay there immobilized, its labored breathing filled the air. I shouted for my remaining teammates to regroup. Sweat poured down our faces, but none of us dared to relax just yet. From the corner of my eye, I noticed a walkie-talkie on the ground next to one of my fallen comrades. I quickly retrieved it and called for backup, hoping that help would arrive soon. Minutes ticked away as we secured our position and maintained our gaze on the incapacitated creature. While waiting for our backup to arrive, our adrenaline levels gradually decreased, and it became apparent how exhausted we were. Our muscles ached from holding steady positions, and our breathing grew heavier. Nonetheless, we could not afford to succumb to fatigue. After what seemed like an eternity, help finally arrived. Reinforcements from our organization swarmed into the area, armed with specialized containment equipment and sedatives designed for this specific purpose. 
We briefly caught glimpses of worry on their faces when they took in the gore that surrounded us but continued with their work with urgency. With the creature successfully sedated, they placed it in a specially designed container and prepared to transport it away from the scene. We followed suit, but not without reminiscing about our lost friends and silent tributes. At the debriefing with our higher-ups afterward, we recounted every horrifying detail of the encounter, how quickly it had eviscerated two members of our team and how close we were to being annihilated ourselves. We realized how lucky we were that hadn't been undone by panic or poor strategy. In response, our superiors decided to take appropriate measures against this creature's possible reemergence. Investigations would be conducted on its origins and methods developed to combat it more effectively in case of another encounter. They also committed to providing better training for everybody involved so that minimal harm could be inflicted in the future. Days later, we received an update. Scientists had researched the creature and discovered that it was a rare, highly dangerous species previously thought to be extinct. Its habitat had been destroyed, forcing it out of hiding and into the human world. Relieved to know that the danger had been contained for now, we continued our work. The memory of our fallen friends was ever-present in our minds as we vowed to carry on the work we had started, together. As time went by, I occasionally found myself mulling over that fateful day's events. It was a reminder of how fragile life could be and how important it was to continue working to protect humanity from the emerging dangers hidden in the shadows. The grisly reality of what we had faced and lost seemed almost surreal, a violent chapter in our lives that none of us would ever forget. But it also bonded us together, forged from the fires of adversity. From here on out, there were no guarantees or assurances only our resolve to keep moving forward no matter the cost. We knew that time did not wait, nor did the horrors that encroached upon mankind every day. With a renewed sense of purpose, we pressed ahead with our missions, determined never to let such a tragedy beset us again. In remembrance of our lost friends, torn from this world in such violence, their sacrifices served as the catalyst to propel us further into an uncertain future. But their memories would live forever in our hearts and actions, guiding us forward as we navigated through uncharted territories with a steadfast determination held within each of us. And though we remained vigilant against discoveries yet untold, one truth stood out the most— Life was fleeting and extinguished in an instant by unforeseen crisis or mistake. We would honor those who'd fallen by safeguarding what they left behind, friends, family, and an ever-changing world, we were ultimately responsible for protecting. My name is Caddick Harrington, and I like my coffee black. I was in the deep woods of the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania. The area was so dense, it was challenging to see through the foliage even during the day. As part of an elite task force, our mission was to hunt monsters that lurked in the shadows. Legends had long whispered of a creature by a name none of us could recall. Hey, Caddick, my partner Silas Aldrich called to me over our walkie-talkies. How's your side of the creek? Dry as ever, I replied. I paused to catch my breath. The air was damp and heavy with moisture, making it difficult for me to breathe. I considered taking off my boots and wading into the creek, but then remembered why we were there. It wasn't time to slack off. We were investigating a series of gruesome killings that had rocked the nearby community. All of them had something eerily similar, an unsettling sense of brutality and gore. Unidentifiable body parts would appear in random places, leaving families heartbroken and detectives baffled. 
As darkness was setting upon us, Silas decided it wasn't wise for us to be separated, so he crossed over to my side of the creek. The victims, I discussed with Silas as we trekked onwards, haven't exhibited any sort of pattern. They come from all walks of life, professionals, teachers, students. It's terrifying, Silas chimed in agreement. Continuing our descent through thick brush and uneven terrain, we both started feeling uneasy. It felt as though the air around us had become thick with fear. That's when we found it, a recently mauled body not far off the path. We radioed back to camp for backup without hesitating. Something was close by. As we stood there, the hairs on the back of our necks stood up in unison. Our senses sharpened. Our hands tightly gripped our flashlights and firearms. A low growl echoed through the trees, increasing in volume with each second. We immediately shifted into defensive positions, scanning the darkness for any sign of the beast. Remember, Silas, I said in hushed urgency. These things are fast and calculated, and with an appetite for human flesh— there was a rustle among the low-hanging branches to our right, and we both swung our lights in unison. In that moment, we spotted it, our target, a creature so horrifically grotesque that it defied all logic. Covered in coarse fur and standing upright on two legs like a man, its eyes had an unnatural glint to them as though filled with a perverse hunger. Suddenly lunging towards us at an alarming pace— we barely had time to react. Panic bubbled up inside me as I frantically raised my firearm and fired a barrage of shots into the oncoming monster. The creature approached with astonishing speed, and my shots only seemed to slow it down momentarily. Blood from its wounds spattered across my skin as it barreled toward me, determination evident in its gruesome features. Silas and I both knew that neither of us could combat this monster alone, so we both acted quickly and called for help through our radios. As the creature continued to advance, I fired another round at it, hoping to halt it long enough for backup to arrive. Popping sounds echoed around us as Silas added his own gunfire to mine. Yet, the creature appeared unfazed by our efforts. It continued to charge us with such force that my heart pounded in my chest. Suddenly, a surge of intense pain enveloped my shoulder as the creature struck me with one of its clawed limbs, sending me hurtling against the nearest tree trunk. With no time for a proper response, all I could do was scream in agony from the impact. Silas, realizing that he wouldn't be able to hold off this beast on his own, pleaded through our radio channels for immediate assistance. Fortunately, our distress signal had been heard. Reinforcements arrived just in time to witness the monstrous being racing after Silas. Trained professionals wasted no time in assessing the situation, and quickly began firing at the creature. Yet even as their bullets tore through its flesh, it barely faltered, still driven by an insatiable hunger. One particularly brave officer managed to position himself between Silas and the beast. Grabbing the creature's attention with a well-timed gunshot, he lured it away from us and into a hailstorm of gunfire from his fellow officers. The creature fought relentlessly against their efforts, but finally succumbed to its numerous injuries. Its once frenzied growls devolved into faint whimpers before ceasing altogether. With both relief and horror cutting through the air, the team wasted no time in containing the creature's battered, lifeless form. Knowing these attacks couldn't be ignored, they immediately pursued a full investigation. Upon closer examination, they discovered that the creature was just a deformed wolf, or at least they assumed so. It had facial features resembling that of a human— with a hunched posture and arms significantly longer than any wolf's should be. Its matted fur and twisted limbs made it appear alien, but there were enough similarities to assume its species' origin. 
The thought of such a monstrous aberration on the loose was chilling. Nevertheless, we all felt a sense of closure with its death. The team quickly went to work dissecting the creature to garner any possible information from its remains, information that might prevent future incidents like this one. This mere fact did little to ease my mind considering how long an anomaly like this may have lived undetected in our small town. I sighed as I watched Silas being tended to by medics, knowing he would need intense therapy for both his physical and mental well-being in the coming months but we had each other for support through such times. At the end of the day, we knew that our encounter with this beast would not only haunt us, but would also shape our resolve to help anyone who had ever encountered their own monster. As we departed from the site of our confrontation, I couldn't help but glance back at the carcass. One thought kept echoing in my mind. If such a mutation could occur in a seemingly ordinary wolf— what else hides in the shadows of our world unknown? My name is Elijah Beckford, and I've been a detective with the Notorious Monster Task Force for what seems like forever. Our latest mission brought us to the dense Manistee National Forest in western Michigan. Among these towering trees and lush undergrowth, we believed that an elusive beast was preying upon unsuspecting hikers. There were five of us in our team, led by Julius Thompson, seasoned monster hunter and always eager to catch another unknown creature. By his side was Zosia Berkowski, a brilliant medic and tactical strategist who could save a life and take one at the same time. Next in line was Jericho O'Shaughnessy, a lively Irishman with the sharpest wit at our base camp. Finally, there was Callisto Lozano, a rugged veteran with a mysterious past who spoke little but carried impressive firepower. We trekked through thick vegetation, drawing closer to the beast's suspected hunting grounds. A disturbing scene earlier had set the mood for our mission, an upturned campsite its tents torn to shreds as though ravaged by some colossal creature. Blood splatters told a gruesome tale of violence and fear. It chilled my bones as I recalled my childhood experience, discovering my friend mauled by some unknown predator in the woods near my home, not too different from what we had stumbled upon today. But time pressed on, and we continued our search in silence listening for any rustling leaves or snapping twigs that could signal our quarry's presence. Occasionally we found eerily familiar claw marks scraped across tree trunks or suspicious droppings left behind that carried a foul stench reminiscent of rotting meat. The sun dipped below the horizon, giving way to an orchestra of insects calling out into the night. As darkness grew thicker around us, we stayed alert and communicated with gestures to maintain our stealth. Suddenly we heard something massive crashing towards us through the undergrowth. The clamor was horrendous, and it bordered on cliché to find ourselves running into what would be the most terrifying encounter of our careers. Through a dense thicket ahead, we caught a glimpse of our monstrous assailant. Its hulking figure stood unlike any creature we had ever seen seemingly a blend between crocodile, wolf, and human. In size, it towered over anything humanly possible, with reptilian scales that shimmered against the moonlight and formidable claws that could leave deep gashes in its prey with just one swipe. After a brief moment where we were frozen by the shock of our first encounter, Julius was the first to snap back to reality. Everyone, weapons up! He barked in a hushed whisper. We all followed suit, lifting our guns towards this abomination of nature. Soja approached cautiously with her tranquilizer rifle in hand, aiming for the beast's neck. She squeezed the trigger, letting loose a dart that punctured the monster's hideous scaly exterior. It roared ferociously before disappearing into the vegetation. 
The team followed the creature's tracks and movements, staying as stealthy as possible to avoid being spotted. We tried calling for backup, but the dense foliage and limited cellular reception made it impossible for our calls to go through. We were on our own. Hours of tracking led us deeper into the treacherous forest, where visibility was compromised by the towering trees and the thick underbrush. We found more evidence of the creature's whereabouts, torn limbs from its previous victims, scattered bones not clean of any remaining flesh. At some points, we could hear its guttural growls reverberating through the air around us. The monster seemed to be everywhere, yet nowhere, at once. It became apparent that this creature was more cunning than we ever imagined, possibly even aware that we were in pursuit. Exhaustion threatened to consume us all after another day of relentless pursuit with no tangible results. We set up a makeshift campsite in a small clearing, each taking shifts to keep watch for any signs of danger. During my turn on watch duty, a rustling noise caught my attention. I strained my eyes against the darkness until they could barely make out a pair of eyes staring back at me, yellowish-green and predatory, just like the ones we'd seen before. In that moment, I knew it was the creature. It had found us. I quickly signaled to Julius and Zoja who jumped into action, weapons at the ready. The creature looked straight at me and lunged forward with lightning speed. I dove out of its way just in time as it tore through our campsite, annihilating tents in mere seconds. Zoja took another shot with her tranquilizer rifle but missed by a hair's breadth as the creature slithered into the night once more. We were forced to evacuate immediately. There was no telling when or where it would strike next. For hours, we stumbled through the unforgiving darkness, limbs sore and battered from the harrowing chase that had become our lives. We finally found a remote cabin guarded by desolation, but at least it offered some sort of shelter. We snuck inside, barricading the door with anything we could find. We discussed our options and our only hope lay in attempting to trap the creature before it overtook us. Unfortunately, as we were formulating a plan, the creature struck again. Our defenses were all but useless against its brute force as it shouldered its way through the cabin walls. It identified us one by one, targeting us with lightning-like speed, I managed to scramble under a table and out of sight while Julius was not so lucky, lured out to save Zoja, who had been pinned down by the creature's immense claw pressing on her chest. Though he fought valiantly, Julius was no match for the monster's prowess or agility. With one swift motion, its jaws crushed his skull like an eggshell between its teeth. Before escaping back into the forest, the creature left us with a devastating reminder of what defeat tasted like. The scene was gruesome. Pieces of our friend were strewn around us while Zoja lay unconscious from her injuries. In that moment of grief and terror, I understood it. We had failed. Later findings supported our silent suspicions. This creature we encountered most likely belonged to an unknown species one that may have previously evaded human detection or could have been considered extinct up until now. A cryptid, stalking humanity from shadows far beyond what we have learned. The mission had ended in overwhelming tragedy, voided souls and rivers of guilt rolling over my comrade and me. We couldn't save Julius or stop the creature. However, all we could do was flee back to civilization with the knowledge of what happened tucked away in our hearts, a nightmarish memory that would haunt us for the rest of our lives. And so we lived to share our story, as unbelievable as it may sound. We knew a hidden truth awaited us all out there in the foreboding dark of the wilderness. A reminder of that terrifying creature which had once pursued us with an unyielding determination— an unknown beast, killing in secrecy from the depths of our fears and nightmares.
I leaned against a tree, looking around at the dense forest surrounding me. My name is Atticus Whalen, and I'm part of a covert task force that specializes in hunting and tracking monsters. This operation felt completely natural, especially as the sun began to dip low, casting elongated shadows across the ground. Our unit had received intel on possible creature sightings in these woods, so they sent us in to investigate. Our small team was led by Terran Stratton and included Merrick Salter and me. We had radio communication with HQ, but we were deep in the wilds of Colorado's Sawatch Range, which meant that backup wouldn't be arriving any time soon. As we moved steadily through the underbrush, Terran's foot caught something buried under fallen leaves. It was a dirted, tattered shoe with its shoelaces knotted up. That was strange enough, but as we followed the trail further into the woods, we found more personal items scattered around an abandoned campsite. Weird, Merrick muttered. Looks like someone left in a real hurry. My eyes searched the area for any other clues while Taryn tried unsuccessfully to raise HQ on the radio. The static told us they were too far away or possibly experiencing technical difficulties. Can't get them, she said frustratedly as she put down her radio. We're on our own if anything happens. My attention shifted back towards a faint noise coming from deeper within the woods. The sound was twisted a muffled cry for help perhaps. As a group, we decided to follow it rather than wait for backup that may never come. The farther we ventured into the forest, the darker it grew and my sense of unease expanded with it. I felt like something was lurking behind every tree and bush, watching us but staying just out of sight. Suddenly, Taryn got quiet and motioned for us to stay still. She strained to listen to something and then whispered, There's someone up ahead talking. I had heard nothing but the soft rustle of leaves, but Taryn's ears were more finely tuned. We picked our way carefully toward the source of her concern. As we approached a clearing, a heavy stomping sound echoed through the night air. The monstrous creature that appeared before us sent chills down my spine. Standing over eight feet tall, with long and spindly limbs, it had muscular legs like a gazelle but distorted into something grotesque. Its sharp claws extended menacingly from its fingers that seemed far too long for its body, and an elongated face adorned with rows of razor teeth emerged from deep shadows beneath its bone-like horns. Our task force thought we knew what we were up against when we came into this forest. However, we'd never seen anything like this. The unnerving animalistic creature towered over a whimpering man being held by nothing more than one of its spindly fingers. I signaled for the team to fan out, and we moved into a defensive formation. We had weapons, but the uncertainty of the creature's capabilities made us hesitate to attack. The man it held seemed to be injured, and we didn't want to risk causing him more harm if we could help it. The perimeter is secure whispered Jackson, after he circled around the vicinity. As task force members positioned themselves around the clearing, I tried to think of a way to communicate with the creature without escalating the situation. I decided to take a step forward and hold out my open hands, showing that I was unarmed. The creature tilted its head as if processing my intentions but didn't attack. It continued holding the man as its horrifyingly sharp teeth clenched tighter. Blood trickled down from where its claw punctured the man's skin. Noticing its hesitance, Taryn whispered in my ear, We have no choice. We need to intervene before that man dies. Though we couldn't call for help, there was no time, and our radios were void of signal this deep in the forest. I knew she was right. We had to do something. Jackson, Blake, when I give the word, fire at its legs, I instructed quietly. Taryn, be ready to grab that man once it's distracted. Though we were terrified, 
knowing that this creature could turn on us at any moment without warning, we were equally determined to save the man. I nodded at Jackson and Blake as a signal. They aimed their weapons at the creature's muscular legs and opened fire. The bullets tore through flesh with sickening plops and screams from our target. While the creature reeled from this assault, Taryn dashed forward with incredible speed. She grabbed the injured man out of its loosened grip and retreated back toward us. The rest of our team also began firing their weapons, aiming to slow the creature down further and give us time to escape. We retreated in a staggered formation, with some providing cover fire as others fell back with the injured man. The creature pursued us through the forest, lumbering on its injured legs but still closing the distance quickly. As we reached a thick section of the forest, I shouted to the team, Trip wires! Set them up now! Though we hadn't anticipated an encounter like this, we were well prepared with various strategies for different situations. We hastily set up multiple trip wires between trees at varying heights, aiming to slow down and possibly incapacitate the creature. As it barreled through the forest toward us, some wires wrapped around its limbs, causing it to stumble. The creature roared in pain and fury but continued to close the distance. It tore through trip wires with its claws as if they were mere threads. Taryn! I called out. Get that flare gun and try to disorient it. Taryn nodded and quickly fired a flare into the air near the creature's face. Stepping back from our relentless foe, we noticed that Taryn's plan had worked. The creature shrieked and appeared disoriented for several crucial seconds. This gave us enough time to put more distance between us and regroup for another offensive attempt. By sheer luck, our actions allowed us to escape while keeping ourselves and the injured man alive until backup arrived. Our relief was short-lived as we encountered other creatures like this in the months that followed each requiring refined techniques based on what we learned from our encounters. In those days, we became experts at dealing with these monstrous beings. In time, I discovered rumors circulated about these creatures, a predatory species believed extinct resurfacing due to human encroachment upon their remote habitats. But with no concrete proof or documentation of such species, my team and I were left to question our sanity. Through our efforts, we saved many lives and protected countless others from vicious attacks. We mourned the lives of our fallen comrades, those who had given everything to fight against these terrifying beasts. I still find myself looking back on that fateful night in the forest, the first time we encountered one of those grotesque creatures. Though I cannot shake the haunting memories, I take solace in knowing we made a difference in the coming days, our relentless battles against these unknown beings serving to stem their rise and preserve some semblance of safety for humanity in an increasingly uncertain world. I'm Jacob a part of an elite task force that hunts monsters. My team and I were sent to the Amazon rainforest in Brazil on a mission shrouded in secrecy and whispers. As we trekked deeper into the dense forest, the trees seemed to close in on us, and an eerie silence filled the air. I felt a chill run down my spine and couldn't help but think of my family back home in Texas our little farm where I grew up handling animals and chores. One member of my team was a stout, muscular man named Mortimer Kensfield. He was known for his vast knowledge of firearms, which he always joked about being useful on his hunting trips back in his hometown in Alaska. What's our mission, Mortimer? I asked as I tried to shake off my growing sense of unease. Heard it's some sort of creature. Mortimer replied with a shrug as he adjusted his rifle sling on his shoulder. We had two other members in our group, Clarissa Hartley-Smith, our skilled tracker, 
and Ivan Choyankovsky, our formidable Ukrainian sniper. The four of us were tasked by our employers to track and neutralize an unknown creature responsible for several abductions near the Amazon River. Deeper into the jungle, Clarissa found traces of disturbances in nature that confirmed we're following the right path. We silently moved forward as shadows danced between trees due to sunlight piercing through high above us. While navigating further into the woods, we began discovering gruesome crime scenes. Our first disturbing discovery was a tangled mess hanging from a tree, almost like it was supposed to serve as some sort of warning to ward off intruders. I've never seen anything like this before. Ivan Cho whispered cautiously after double-checking the safety on his sniper rifle. Hours went by as red stains marked our path through the jungle until Clarissa suddenly stopped us. Her eyes were fixed on something ahead, an unusually large clearing that seemed unsettling. Tall trees surrounded the opening like a fortress, leaving only a scraped earth ground where vegetation refused to grow. As we cautiously entered the clearing, I noticed that a foul stench had now filled the air, a mix of decay and a pungent animal smell I could not quite place. Suddenly, the bushes ahead rustled ominously, and something began to emerge. Our jaws dropped as we witnessed the appearance of the creature we were hunting. It was unlike anything we had ever seen before, with pale leathery skin covered in warty growths. Long, sharp claws protruded from its massive hands, and its gaunt body seemed hungry for its next meal. The creature's most unnerving feature, however, was its pronounced lack of eyes. We stared at each other for only a moment before Mortimer instinctively raised his rifle and took aim at the eyeless horror approaching us. A series of echoing gunshots rang out across the vast jungle as Mortimer's bullets found their target. Our team undeniably underestimated the creature's ability to endure damage. Even after taking immeasurable shots, it seemed invulnerable to our attacks. The abhorrent beast kept crawling towards us with eerie certainty even though wounded and dripping scarlet onto the earth. We can't take this thing down! Ivan Cho shouted in panic while frantically searching for an escape amidst the unsettling noises made by this monstrosity chasing us. The moments grew more excruciating as Ivan Cho desperately scrambled into action, trying again and again to make contact with headquarters for backup. That's it, we're on our own, Ivan Cho said with resignation after realizing that help couldn't get to our location quickly enough. Desperate but determined, we decided it was time to leave behind our wounded teammate and find a way out of this living nightmare. In the distance, I could hear the tortured screams of Mortimer fading as our once undefeatable team fell apart under the immense fear of this seemingly invincible monster. And so, I run alongside my colleagues, bound by a mission that's spiraling out of control as we leave the cries for help behind. The line between saving lives and surviving barely existing, while being chased by an ever-closing threat no one was prepared for. We continued running, pushing through the dense overgrowth of vines and branches. The creature relentless in its pursuit, each sound from it sent chills down our spines our mortal enemy nipping at our very heels. Sweat dripped from our faces as we clung to any remaining bits of energy we had. Ivan Cho once again tried to make contact with headquarters, knowing that there was little chance of help arriving. As he spoke into the radio, his voice cracked with exhaustion but desperation clung to every word he earnestly uttered. There was a faint glimmer of hope when a radio transmission came through in response. Alpha team, stay together and keep heading east. We are trying to organize backup for extraction. Our hopes were nothing but short-lived as the creature suddenly lunged forward with incredible speed. It grabbed Evancho's leg, spinning him off balance before proceeding to maul him relentlessly. 
The horrifying scene made it clear that staying meant certain death. We had no choice but to continue running while leaving another one of our colleagues behind. As we took turns to call for help, the calls grew less frequent as distance, and the heavy panting of breaths between sprints meant fewer members could manage more than a couple words at most. The remaining team's faces portrayed sheer terror, as they visibly accepted the grim reality that they might not make it out alive. With my heart pounding violently against my chest, I made an instant decision split for a better chance of survival. Everyone run! Make your own paths and head east! I screamed as loud as I could muster hoping the urgent tone masked my quivering voice. My friends hesitated ever so briefly before finally understanding why, by dividing, hopefully weakening its search and maybe even its drive. As we separated into different directions left through vine arches or right into murkier waters, I knew that this might be our last moments together as a group, and possibly the last moments of our lives. Sprinting desperately towards the east through treacherous terrain and undergrowth, Weighed down by my sodden boots, I caught momentary glimpses of dark figures. The shadowed trees offered only fleeting cover as brief respite before being drawn into the chase anew. Exhaustion and hopelessness spread through me whilst my legs urged me outward could not see anyone else from our team anymore. However, their bitter cries, disparity calls for help invoked a sense of overwhelming guilt. As the pursuit continued for what felt like hours or even days, I tripped and fell to the hard ground. The crushing weight of despair forced me to ask why did we fail? Why did it appear that creature hunted us so mercilessly? Was there any logic to this relentless antagonist? As darkness surrounded me with its somber embrace, I questioned its origin. It had many physical traits one might associate with large mammals living in dense jungles yet possessed an almost supernatural durability. Despite my lack of knowledge of folklore, something akin and uncanny overwhelmed my thoughts as I began to question if perhaps it was a product of humanity's darkest aspect blending with nature into an unthinkable overgrown creation born from their combined monstrosity. As I lay there on that cold, damp forest floor filled with questions and guilt, a faint light flickered in the distance. Could it be rescue? Gathering all my strength, I stumbled into the light gasping for air, pushing all other thoughts aside except for the simple desire to survive another day a chance at redemption. When rescue finally came my pulse raced with elation, but the sense of loss left me feeling empty inside. My comrades who had bravely volunteered for this mission now forever silenced. Their names forever etched onto tombstones and our hearts, Mortimer and Ivan Cho, brave men lost but never forgotten. Now as I peer into the shadows, a lingering feeling of gnawing unease burdens me. Are we safe or have do we only temporarily eluded our monstrous foe? I'm Samuel Jenkins, member of the Enigmatic Task Force Viper, and I've found myself standing on the outskirts of a decrepit town deep inside Pine Barrens, New Jersey. Home to irritable locals and eerie folklore, this place is the last refuge for anyone on the fringes of society. I couldn't help but chuckle, thinking how I ended up here after failing my accountant exams. My partner on this mission is Leonard Fitzpatrick, a boisterous man with a taste for conspiracy theories something we bonded over nights spent sharing stories about Sasquatch over whiskey. Our mission was simple, track down and eliminate the perpetrator of recent kidnappings and murders. As we ventured further into the woods, we stumbled upon a deer torn apart with a gruesome precision that could only be associated with something monstrous. There was an air of dread accompanying us as the atmosphere grew denser. As our surroundings became darker and more intense, we noticed claw marks on trees far larger than any animal we knew of. 
The clues seemed to point towards an unknown predator that had experts baffled. Leonard and I kept a tight grip on our rifles, adrenaline pumping through our veins. In our pursuit, we met an old woman who lived in a secluded cabin. She spoke in hushed tones about a creature that had terrorized generations of Pine Baron's inhabitants and claimed many lives. She refused to meet my eyes when she described its monstrous size and insatiable hunger. Over time Leonard and I grew increasingly impatient. It felt like we were walking around in circles. That was until we heard agonizing screams piercing through the forest. Instinctively, we sprinted towards the sound, praying we were not too late to save this individual. As we entered a clearing beneath the moonlight's muted glow, I hardly had time to register what stood in front of us before Leonard was thrown against a tree trunk, knocking the wind out of him. I stared in terror at the towering, hulking figure of a creature that resembled a beast from our darkest nightmares. It had mottled skin stretched over well-defined muscles and limbs topped with vicious claws. Its feral eyes exuded malice as it drew ragged breaths. It looked simultaneously alien and familiar. Its presence held the forest in an oppressive grip. Nature seemed to bow down to this gruesome predator. Leonard weakly tried to lift his rifle, but the creature closed the distance with horrifying speed, closing its jaws around his forearm, rending flesh, and snapping bones like twigs. The sound of Leonard's agonizing screams mixed with monstrous growls filled my ears, amplifying my own terror. Suddenly, a desperate thought crossed my mind. If we didn't call for backup now, either of us would make it out of this hellish place alive. I fumbled in my pocket for the emergency flare gun that was standard issue for Task Force Viper agents. As Leonard fought bravely against the monstrous beast trying to free his mangled limb from its jaws, I raised the flare gun and fired it into the air before diving behind a tree to avoid detection. The world around us erupted into chaos. An unnatural cacophony of guttural growls and blood-curdling screams colored this macabre dance of death. My heart pounded in my chest, but there was no time to process what was happening. If I wanted to survive, let alone save Leonard, this was going to be a fight like no other. With newfound determination fueling every step, I unholstered my pistol and began firing at the creature's eyes, the only part of its body that seemed vulnerable without placing myself in mortal danger. The bullets was towards their target, but Midway seemed to just disappear into thin air as though swallowed by the darkness itself. My eyes widened in disbelief, and I knew we were dealing with a creature unlike any other, an unstoppable beast that seemed as elusive as it was lethal. As Leonard continued to scream and wrestle with the monstrous attacker, I racked my brain for a plan, rapidly running out of options, feeling the weight of our imminent doom bearing down on me. Seeing no other options, I called out to Leonard. We need to retreat and call for reinforcements. Leonard nodded and started limping toward me, blood streaming from his injured leg. As we hurried through the forest, the creature pursued us relentlessly with heavy steps, shaking the ground beneath. I fired my pistol aimlessly behind me in the hopes of distracting it long enough for us to put some distance between us. We reached a clearing where our vehicle was parked and jumped in. Leonard wincing in pain as he slammed the door shut. I keyed the ignition and sped away, leaving the creature's roars echoing behind us. Once we had reached a safe distance, I grabbed my radio to call for backup. HQ, this is Task Force Viper Agent Ortiz requesting immediate reinforcement at our location. We have encountered an unknown and highly dangerous creature. Copy that, Agent Ortiz, the operator responded. Stay put and wait for backup. While waiting for help to arrive, I helped Leonard bandage his leg wound, providing some temporary relief against the creature's brutal attack. 
when reinforcements arrived, I described the sinister beast with as much detail as possible. Its large size, heavily muscled body, large teeth capable of crushing bone, impenetrable hide that stopped bullets mid-flight, and seemingly intelligent behavior that was consistently one step ahead of our efforts. A specialist team was assigned to investigate and capture the creature, equipped with state-of-the-art weaponry designed specifically for such unclassified creatures. Meanwhile, Leonard and I were sent back to headquarters for evaluation and debriefing. Several days later, we received the shocking news. Task Force Viper agents had not only successfully captured the creature but also identified it as a hybrid experiment gone awry. It seemed that scientists attempting to engineer improved military animals had inadvertently combined the worst traits of multiple predators into one lethal package. The thought of such unethical experimentation taking place in secret shook me to the core and left me questioning if more of these grotesque creatures existed, the dark truth hidden behind closed doors. Careful analysis of the creature's DNA revealed traces of grizzly bear, tiger, and crocodile genes within its genome. These animals were blended together with such precision that the offspring was mercilessly efficient in killing. As I pondered the implications, I couldn't help but reflect on Leonard's ordeal and how close we both came to being mauled to death by this monster. It made me realize that despite the unfathomable suffering we had endured, our shared experience had forged an unbreakable bond between us. In the end, it was reported that the mastermind behind the hybrid experiment was caught by authorities and detained on charges related to illegal genetics research and animal cruelty. The perpetrator's name was kept under wraps leaving us wondering who was capable of carrying out such horrifying acts. As for the creature itself, after a lengthy period of observation and study, it was concluded by the scientific community that it could not be reintroduced into any natural habitat. The decision was made to euthanize it, a grim reminder of man's meddling with nature. Leonard eventually recovered from his injuries over time. We continued working as Task Force Viper agents, now more vigilant than ever against the unseen terrors lurking in our world. To this day, we continue striving to protect humanity from not only supernatural threats, but also from those created through our own misguided ambition. My name is Ezekiel Dupont, and my team and I are deep within the dense Wisman's wood in Dartmoor, England. This ancient, twisted woodland is where we pursue a particularly elusive and deadly creature. As an experienced member of a specialized monster hunting task force, I've witnessed the grotesque and horrifying aftermaths of this beast's unique killing methods. During our secret mission, we're on edge but prepared to confront whatever horrors await us. Soraya Papadopoulos, our team's medic and tracker, maintains a steady pace beside me. Anderson Toft, our weapons expert, checks his firearms vigilantly while muttering quips that make us chuckle despite our unease. We stumble across disturbing scenes as we delve deeper into the woods. Mangled bodies abandoned by the creature we're hunting, blood splattered on nearby trees. These gruesome sights betray the calm appearance of the peaceful forest surrounding us. At dusk, we set up camp, taking turns keeping watch. Sleep eludes me, and so I exchange stories of past hunts and distant memories with Soraya and Anderson. We share relatable experiences grounding us in our humanity amid this blood-soaked pursuit. In the dead of night, Anderson alerts us to something rustling nearby. We arm ourselves for whatever danger lies ahead. Cautiously approaching the source of the disturbance, we realize just how massive the creature is. A hulking mass of dark fur and rippling muscles stalking stealthily through Wisman's wood. 
It leaps from its hiding place like a bolt of lightning. Its mutated form would resemble a bear if not for its unnaturally elongated body with serrated bony spikes protruding along its spine. Rows of teeth glint in moonlight as it roars at the challenge we present. The tension in our team dissipates instantly as we snap into action. Years of training kick in like second nature. Guns blazing, we fire upon the creature while falling back to avoid its massive claws threatening to maim or kill us. Formidable and resilient, the creature shrugs off most bullets and presses on. My heart races as I reload, feeling the weight of responsibility for my team's survival. Soraya provides triage on Anderson's gash leg while keeping an eye on our ever-advancing adversary. I glance over my shoulder, relieved to see no creatures of similar ilk stalking us from behind. It's a small comfort amidst this nightmarish pursuit. Through grit and determination, we corner the creature in a nearby clearing. But all attempts at neutralizing it are futile, for this beast is not a mere animal or abomination. It is a living harbinger of carnage and despair. With danger looming only a few meters away from us, our banter vanishes, discarded like spent rounds littering the forest floor. We forego any thoughts of reinforcements. Time is too precious and lives hang in the balance. Though our task force has faced unspeakable evil before, nothing could prepare us for what unfolds before us now. The chase intensifies as we track the creature through mossy thickets filled with gnarled roots that seem to reach out, begging for respite from centuries of bloodshed spilled upon them. A barrage of bullets ensues as Anderson struggles to keep pressure on his wounded leg while defiantly firing back at our monstrous adversary. As the relentless pursuit draws us further into the dense foliage, eager breaths punctuate the air, each heartbeat a stark reminder that we're alive but teetering on death's precipice. But ever forward we forge amidst panic and strife. We push through the underbrush, trying to maintain a safe distance from the creature while simultaneously staying in pursuit. It's a balancing act that tests our already strained nerves. Each crunch of leaves beneath my feet sends twinges of fear racing through my body. The beast is unlike anything we've ever encountered, with its immense size, muscular build, and razor-sharp claws that seem capable of tearing a person into pieces. As we race deeper into the forest, I can't help but think about calling for backup. But our radio signals are compromised in these dense woods, leaving us stranded and blind. The hope of getting support from outside diminishes with every passing minute, but am I willing to risk losing this monster or Anderson's life by calling for help? Time runs against us as the creature leaps further and further into the endless verdure. The fiend comes to an abrupt halt near an underground cavern entrance hidden by nature. Before we have time to regroup, it launches an assault on Soraya. I run forward and take aim at its grotesque head a mix of scales and coarse fur intertwining into one unholy creation. I fire at it blindly, hoping against hope that one bullet would pierce through its seemingly impenetrable flesh. Anderson fires as well, his injured leg dangling beneath him, putting everything he has in his remaining shots. Even his wounded self doesn't deter him from fighting this nightmare creature before us. Soraya clambers back towards us while furiously emptying her entire magazine into the beast. Gasping for breath, she manages to narrowly escape death as Anderson and I fire more rounds into the abomination. The monster withstands our onslaught but seems distracted by the appearance of another strange creature emerging from the depths of ulocal.cards.setTarget, subheading LH1, Underground Cavern. Its hideous form comprises a swollen abdomen, long needle-like legs, and an ooze-like liquid that drips down its body. It swipes at the behemoth before us, releasing a guttural roar as it clashes with the enemy we've come to despise. 
Our horrified gazes meet each other as we realize that our initial quarry is no longer our sole concern. But one thing is clear, we aren't alone in this forest. Seizing the opportunity, we retreat, dragging Anderson along with us. As we flee, the sounds of bone-chilling screeches emitted by the dueling creatures pierce through the air. The battle between these monstrous beings has offered us a temporary reprieve, and we must capitalize on it. We navigate our way back towards our vehicle, hidden securely within a dense patch of trees. Soraya and I struggle to carry Anderson, his leg now torn and mangled from his gunshot wound worsened by the chasing beast. Once safely inside our vehicle, I fire up the engine and speed away from the forest's edge. As we leave that nightmare behind, I nervously glance into the rearview mirror, praying those creatures aren't behind us. The forest fades into darkness, swallowed by the shadows of night. Each passing moment feels like an eternity until finally we reach civilization. A small emergency center awaits on the edge of town, the sight of it comfortingly human in contrast with the horrors we've seen tonight. Upon entering, we're greeted by medical personnel who immediately attend to Anderson's injuries. As they work on him, Soraya eventually notices my trembling hands and worry flushed across my face. She asks me something about calling for backup earlier in the encounter, but her words are hollow. Even though I can't comprehend her message, I nod in agreement when she says calling for backup wouldn't have changed anything considering how deep into that hellish forest we were. In silence, I reflect upon our decisions that lead us to this point. While our actions may have weighed on us, they've now become part of our shared experiences. And as I think back on our ordeal, I'm left with one haunting question. What living hell birthed these monstrosities that we encountered deep within the forest? I used to think the town of Marble Falls, nestled in the woods, was all about the scenic beauty and quiet atmosphere. The first day on the job proved me wrong. I'm Derek Kennan, part of the specialized task force that hunts and tracks monsters. Once I met my teammates Iris Whitley, Drake Welding, and Tamron Mallory, we quickly got down to business. A creature had been stalking and killing in our sleepy town, consuming its victims in brutal ways, always leaving barely recognizable remains. People mostly kept it silent out of fear. We wondered why they didn't call for help earlier. It was always hard for residents to get the words out when faced with something unimaginable. Iris recalled a case she had solved in a similar situation years ago in another small town while cracking a sarcastic joke that lightened the mood. As we pieced together everything we knew, we decided that our next move should be investigating the woods surrounding Marble Falls. The more we discussed our plan of action, the more excited and revved up I got. I have always been fascinated by unusual creatures. It's part of what led me to join this task force in the first place. When not on a mission, I enjoy reading about unsolved supernatural mysteries and can spend hours engrossed in gut-wrenching stories. We trekked deep into the woods. Our boots made soft crunching noises as we stepped on twigs and dry leaves littering the forest floor. The intense smell of damp earth enveloped us while sun rays struggled to break through thick canopies overhead. Everything seemed so ordinary at first until we reached a dark and quiet area near the riverbank. It appeared as though this was where the creature had hidden its latest victim bones lay scattered with gnawed-off flesh clinging to them. We examined them closely and discovered something peculiar traces of lucid black fluid indicating the creature had exuded it during or after killing its prey. We decided to split up to cover more ground. I went eastward with Mallory, and it wasn't long before we stumbled upon another gruesome scene. Holy moly! 
Mallory said through gritted teeth, stepping back. A few feet in front of us lay a pile of fresh bones, flesh strewn around haphazardly like discarded wrappers. Whoever this creature was, it didn't care for subtlety. Anxiety spread over us thickly as we did our best to gather any evidence that might help us determine the creature's identity. Drake and Iris radioed in from their search area, voices crackling through the forest air they had found something similar. As night started to creep in, we regrouped near a clearing. We began describing our findings, trying to piece together a pattern that would reveal not only the creature's nature but also possibly its weaknesses. The monster in question seemed to choose victims randomly, but each killing looked more brutal than the last one. The kills were barely spaced apart, as if whatever hunted these woods relished in increasing cruelty. I couldn't shake the image of those bloodied bones lying on the ground throughout our discussions it unsettled me deeply. It was vital for our mission that we catch this beast before it killed again. After careful deliberation and strategizing, we set a plan into motion and armed ourselves with firearms and appropriate gear. Knowing we were about to confront this powerful creature inspired mixed feelings fear intermingling with determination. We decided that covering more ground by splitting up again was crucial. Mallory made a quip under his breath about the worst camping trip he'd ever been on, making us all smirk despite the tension that brewed beneath our nerves. The forest air grew dense as darkness enveloped what little sunlight remained. Our flashlights cut through the black, eerie silence accompanying our cautious footsteps. As we ventured on, listening for any unusual sounds, my mind drifted to stories of hunters who encountered an unimaginable truth and didn't have time to react. Suddenly, a scream pierced the air, sending a jolt through me. We rushed towards the location of the harrowing cry. Exhausted lungs gasping for breath, we stumbled upon Drake, his eyes filled with horror as he pointed to shocking remnants. There it was, the half-devoured body of a missing man we were searching for until now presumed merely lost. The gruesome sight of the half-devoured man left us all in shock. Our mission had suddenly become much more urgent and personal. I looked around at my companions, and I could see the same expression on all their faces. We needed to act fast for our own survival as well as for others who might be at risk. We couldn't waste time calling for help. There was no telling where this creature was or when it would strike again. Mallory took charge, asking Drake to lead us back to where he'd heard the scream. The four of us moved cautiously through the dark forest, trying not to make noise, our weapons at the ready. As we continued through the dense undergrowth, I spotted something strange, a trail of blood that seemed to snake across the ground. I pointed it out to the group, and we began following it, our senses heightened and anticipating danger at every turn. After a short while, we came upon another gruesome scene, another mutilated body savagely torn apart. This time, it was Grace, one of our fellow searchers. Her lifeless eyes stared blankly into the void, and we couldn't help but feel a rising sense of panic. Drake picked up his pace as he continued following the blood trail. He suddenly stopped in his tracks and whispered urgently, I see something. Not far off in the darkness was a shadowy figure crouching over yet another body. It was larger than any human and covered in fur. Its powerful arms held its prey in a deathly grip while razor-sharp teeth tore through flesh with disturbing ease. In unspoken agreement, we took aim with our firearms and opened fire on the monstrous creature. It bellowed out a guttural roar in surprise and pain as bullets found their mark. Wasting no time, it lumbered away from us deeper into the woods. With adrenaline coursing through our veins, we gave chase— attempting to keep up with the beast. It moved quickly despite its size and apparent injuries. 
Soon, we found ourselves in a clearing where the creature had backed itself against the rocky walls of a cave. Drake moved slowly and deliberately towards the wounded creature while Mallory and I kept our weapons trained on it should it try and escape, or worse, attack us. With nowhere to go, the desperate creature eyed us all, snarling as it weighed its options. Suddenly, it launched forward at a staggering speed, focusing its attack on me. I fired off several shots, but it was already too close. I felt immense pressure as one of its massive arms wrapped around my torso while its other arm swiped at Mallory. Mallory managed to dodge most of the attack but still took a nasty swipe to his side. He winced but did not let his pain distract him from firing off more shots at the monster holding me captive. Our continued gunfire began to wear down the powerful creature, but not before dealing significant damage to my body. The deafening roar diminished into guttural whimpers as it finally succumbed to its wounds. With my last bit of strength, I pushed away from the limp body of our foe. I glanced over at Mallory, beaten but alive. Both Drake and he came over to help me back up on unsteady feet. We took a moment to assess our injuries and determine that although they were serious, none of them were life-threatening in the immediate future. We decided our top priority now was to get back and warn others about this monstrous threat, in case there were more. Together we made our way out of the forest as daylight began to break. The experience left us all rattled beyond measure but also instilled within each of us an indomitable sense of survival and camaraderie. We would eventually manage to leave the nightmare behind. Every so often, however, the whispered stories of the creature we encountered would resurface, reminding me of what we took part in that night our harrowing battle in the woods. Though I may never know the nature or origin of that monster, one thing is certain, it's an experience I will never forget. I often reflect on that gruesome ordeal and my fallen comrades, both human and creature alike. But despite everything, I am still here, thankful to be alive and eternally grateful for my fellow survivors. I'm Greg Huxley, standing near the entrance of Aokigahara Forest in Japan, a dense woodland notorious for its eerie atmosphere and unsettling history. I work for a task force that specializes in hunting and tracking monsters. Today was the beginning of yet another secret mission. Our team, comprised of talented individuals like Daria Zukov and Elias Mulder, gathered together to discuss our strategy. We were investigating a string of disturbing disappearances that left families devastated without answers. We set off into the forest, armed with specialized equipment like thermal imaging goggles and firearms loaded with explosive rounds. As we traveled deeper into the woods, Daria mentioned she left school on scholarship to become an engineer only to abandon her dreams when faced with a monstrous threat. The forest grew darker and our senses heightened as we moved cautiously through the tangled undergrowth. We came upon an abandoned campsite covered in blood, but something about it sent shivers down my spine. It wasn't just gory. It was perverse as if whatever did this was taunting us. Discussing this sickening discovery, Elias quipped, Looking on the bright side, at least they didn't have to pay off their student loans. I chuckled nervously, any levity appreciated in such a grim situation. We continued searching for answers or survivors but found neither, only more gruesome carnage hinting at an unimaginable threat. One still evening, as the sky grew pitch black and cool air settled around us, we stumbled upon a cave entrance, partially obscured by foliage. Before entering old man Thompson jokingly warned us not to be eaten by bears. He was always good at easing tensions during difficult search missions like this one. 
as we push deeper into the cave with nothing but our rugged determination guiding us forward. Suddenly there was a piercing yelp from old man Thompson. Lurching around against the darkness basking upon what little light we all could glean together. There it was, an incredible mass of muscle and sinew towering over us. Its eyes glowed yellow with an almost primal intensity, as its massive claws dripped with dark blood. The creature before us resembled a bear, but its twisted anatomy hinted at something far more sinister. It moved lightning fast for something so large, pinning Thompson against the wall with one huge paw. Branches and rocks snapped under the force as we all spread out and tried to retaliate. Try to flank it! Elias shouted while firing a barrage of shots at the creature, but it hardly seemed phased by our weapons. Daria attempted to contact headquarters through our radio, but her frantic calls for help were met only with a deafening silence that echoed throughout the cave in reply. As the creature raised its other paw to strike, I couldn't help but think about my son at home waiting up for me while I raced into danger day after day. The demon's attack missed my chest by mere inches as I rolled out from under its deadly reach. The cave's cold air enveloped us, and I felt a mixture of fear and determination. We had a responsibility to protect the lost civilians who wandered into this cave but we were also faced with a terrifying force beyond our comprehension. While I was distracted, a crushing weight hit me from behind. The air left my lungs as I was thrown against the wall, narrowly avoiding the twisted bear-like creature's incoming blow. Get out! Get out of the cave now! Old man Thompson screamed as he struggled under the massive paw pinning him against the wall. It was hard to leave the old man alone in that dark, treacherous place as we scrambled back toward the cave's entrance. But there was no way we could fight that thing without more firepower or without knowing what it truly was. We needed to call for help. Elias went outside to ensure a clearer connection with headquarters while Daria and I paused at the cave entrance, listening for any sign of Thompson or the beast. Through ragged breaths, Elias managed to get in touch with our team outside and describe our situation, begging them for backup. As we waited for their arrival, time seemed to slow down. Every second felt like an eternity, with our minds racing about what was happening inside that cave. My chest tightened when I heard screams echoing from the depths of the cavern below. Their pain was palpable, and it only heightened our sense of urgency and panic. Finally, a heavily armed rescue team arrived, led by Commander Stevens. Upon hearing about our encounter with the creature, Commander Stevens immediately ordered us to remain behind while his team ventured deeper into the cave system. Though we wanted to go back in and help Thompson, we knew that retreat was our best option at this point. Anything else would likely lead to more deaths and injuries. So we hunkered down near the entrance of the cave, which seemed like an entirely different world now, and prayed for Thompson's safe return. Hours crawled by as we kept vigil in the chilly night air. No sounds could be heard from within except for the occasional distant echo reminiscent of a terrible battle. I thought about old man Thompson when we first found that cave, how he tried to ease our nervousness with jokes. Now my heart clenched with dread, wondering whether those would be his last laughs. Without warning, a bloodied figure stumbled out of the darkness. It was Thompson, injured but alive. He collapsed at the entrance of the cave, his breath ragged and strained. Daria quickly tended to his wounds as Commander Stevens and his team emerged from the shadows. Debriefing ensued as we regrouped in the safety of our base camp. Commander Stevens explained that they had found several mutilated remains, presumably belonging to recently lost civilians. They also discovered the remains of what appeared to be an unknown species of mutated bear deep within the cave system, killed by their relentless gunfire. 
The base's scientists studied photographs taken by the team during their mission and determined that although there was no definitive answer about its origin, the creature shared some characteristics with known bear species but had mutated grotesquely. Though speculation swirled about radiation exposure or secret science experiments gone wrong, we knew that answers were still far off in the distance. The search mission ended with a bittersweet victory. We had successfully located and killed an unknown menace, but in exchange for countless innocent lives lost and a haunting sense of uncertainty about whether more creatures like it lurked in hidden corners of our world. In time, we returned to our duties, rescuing lost civilians and exploring mysteries. But old man Thompson's injury forced him into retirement. I visited him frequently back in town, reminiscing about memories shared during our countless missions together over mugs of hot coffee each steaming brew warming our hands against the chilling thought of that page in our lives. We never managed to uncover the creature's true origin or whether its kind truly ceased to exist. But we remained forever vigilant, with a sense of urgency to stay alert and alive in a world where unimaginable nightmares could emerge from the darkest corners at any moment. I'm Felix Meyer, a hunter with a special task force, and I found myself standing in the dense woods of Blue Ridge Parkway, Virginia. My boots sank quietly into the soft, damp soil as I surveyed the eerie surroundings. Tall trees stood like ancient guardians, their branches casting twisted shadows upon the forest floor. My team, Rose McGrath and Julian Carrington, were by my side. We knew each other well. Rose shared several stories about her recent divorce while Julian often mentioned his dedication to his older sister and her kids. We were on an unusual mission, tracking a monstrous creature responsible for many gruesome murders and disappearances in this area. Rose, what do you make of those tracks? I called as I knelt beside a set of strange imprints in the dirt. They don't match any local wildlife. She replied with furrowed brows as we measured the outlines with paper and pen. Do we have time for another freaking joke from that funny horror book you brought last time? Julian asked oddly enough to keep up morale. We all laughed at the gesture and continued advancing cautiously. As we ventured deeper into the heart of the woods, we stumbled upon the remains of another victim. The scene was chilling. Skin shredded from limbs, blood-stained earth. Repressing disgust and fear, we marked our location on our GPS trackers before pressing onward, but not before Rose suggested calling for backup. It's good to have backup with something like this, Julian agreed. But new orders buzzed through my earpiece. If backup crossed paths with our target before preparations finished, lives would be lost. We resumed pursuit alone. We reached a clearing that opened onto rocky terrain when something rustled in the bushes. Reacting instantly, we drew our weapons only to find a pair of panicked deer sprinting away, until sharp growls echoed nearby. Their desperate bleats ended abruptly. Traumatic silence followed. With heavy breaths and pounding hearts, we tightened our grips on our weapons as a monstrous figure appeared the daylight casting its horrifying reality. It was an unholy amalgamation of eyes, gore-flecked fur, and rows of sharpened teeth within its gaping maw. The beast prowled before us with sinister intent. Without warning or hesitation, it lunged for Rose. Julian fired a shot that hit the creature. A roar of pain and anger echoed as it retreated, vanishing into the shadows. We hurried over to aid Rose, uninjured but rattled by her brush with death. Didn't think something like that was real. Julian muttered in disbelief as we regrouped, muscles tense. The creature's attacks escalated in both frequency and ferocity. 
Its viciousness reached new levels as it pursued us relentlessly using stealth and cunning strategy. One particular troubling incident saw it stalking a group of missing hikers before dispatching them one by one. We found their remains scattered across a gruesome trail. We need to stop that thing, I said solemnly as my heart bled for the victims and their families. Luck seemed to abandon us when one moonlit night, while on high alert, it burst through the trees towards Julian. Quick shots rang out. The beast yowled but took no harm. It charged fiercely again as I holstered my gun and pulled out my silver-coated blade. Ignoring moments of fear searing through my nerves, I engaged the savage creature in close combat as my comrades provided cover fire. The battle raged on amidst a crescendo of snarls, screams, and gunfire, every attack met by razor-sharp teeth and rending claws. As the struggle continued, I felt the silver blade slice through the air, barely missing the creature each time. Its movements were swift, calculated, and ruthless. Rose and Julian attempted to assist me, reloading and firing their weapons at it. Closer and closer, its teeth came to my face each time I managed to dodge an attack. Suddenly, the opportunity presented itself, a moment of vulnerability in the creature's assault. Seizing this split second, I plunged the silver blade into the side of its neck. A high-pitched shriek filled the air as it stumbled back, claws gripping the wound. It retreated into the darkness once again. We didn't wait for it to return. As fast as our legs could carry us, we fled from the scene. Our breasts came heavy and ragged as we ran blindly through the woods, desperate to find help and escape this nightmare. Upon reaching a nearby town, we contacted local authorities. They were skeptical about our claims at first but agreed to investigate after seeing our genuine terror and desperation etched on our faces. Julian also produced photographs he had managed to capture of the creature before our flight. The investigation revealed more gruesome findings in different locations, further evidence that we weren't fabricating our story. In an attempt to identify this beast from their database of known predators, law enforcement brought in a wildlife expert. After carefully analyzing the photos and comparing them with current scientific knowledge, the expert concluded that no known species matched this predator's characteristics. The closest resemblance was a species of big cat found in distant regions not native to our area, but even that didn't account for some features or behaviors exhibited by this vicious creature. News of our horrific encounters spread across local media outlets like wildfire stirring up fear and concern amongst residents of nearby towns and communities. We were simultaneously hailed as lucky survivors and received questioning looks from those trying to put together logical explanations for what had happened. Meanwhile, a search party comprised of law enforcement, wildlife experts, and hunters scoured the area for any sign of the creature. The attack site was cordoned off as they tried to piece together clues to learn more about it. Days turned into weeks, and the authorities never found the beast. Fearful whispers that the creature would strike again haunted the townspeople who organized night watches and secured their homes. Life took on a somber tone as we moved forward with the grief of losing those hikers always present in our hearts. We held a memorial service in their honor, sharing stories of their bravery and offering condolences to their families. During this time, Julian kept researching about the creature, trying to understand its origins. He immersed himself in reading about various mythological and cryptozoological creatures reaching out to numerous experts in his quest. Despite his best efforts, we never got any concrete conclusions about what kind of being it was that targeted us. As time passed, fear subsided but never vanished completely. People learned to live with it, and we cautiously resumed our lives too. Though law enforcement continued to look out for the creature, 
It never reappeared after that fateful encounter. Our horrifying experience left an everlasting impact on our lives. Even as time blurred some memories, others remained crystal clear. Instances of bravery, loss, despair, and survival against something unpredictable and sinister lurking in the shadows. The only certainty we had was that whatever it was that hunted us that moonlit night was still out there, waiting patiently for its next opportunity. And so, while life carried on as usual for most people around us, Rose, Julian and I continuously looked over our shoulders, taking no solace from the unanswered questions surrounding our encounter with a predator that defied classification or explanation. I'm Arnold Jenkins, deep in Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario, Canada. The silence here is deafening, apart from the rare rustling of leaves or distant crunching of gravel. My colleagues and I are part of a secret task force with one mission to hunt and track monsters. Yesterday afternoon, we stumbled upon a grisly scene near our campsite. Several mutilated bodies were strewn about their faces contorted in terror. It was a macabre sight that sent shivers down my spine. As we analyzed the remains, Karen Myers, our forensic expert, emphasized the absence of any known animal patterns. Samira Rizvi, our tactical liaison with local law enforcement, chimed in, confirming there had been reports of missing persons last week. We decided to split into two groups to cover more ground. Joined by two other hunters, Leonard Scott and Mark Hopkins, I took the northwest trail deeper into the dense woods. Soon a ripe stench assaulted our nostrils, a nauseating mix of decay and burnt flesh. We proceeded cautiously towards the smell. Nearing a clearing where several trees had toppled and bushes crushed as though by immense force, I spotted heaps of bones some nod clean to their core. It seemed like we were approaching something sinister. As I stepped backward to inform the others of my discovery, I heard Leonard let out a blood-curdling scream followed by an abrupt silence. Mark and I moved swiftly to assist him, but found nothing more than bloody stains on the mangled foliage near where he stood moments earlier. While keeping our nerves steady, Mark had only one thing to say. The monster mustn't know others are aware of its existence. With wide-eyed suspicion, we moved carefully through the trembling trees and shadows twisted by sun rays. No sound remained apart from our heavy breathing and agonizing thoughts of what might have happened to Leonard. Continuing our search, we stumbled upon an old, abandoned cabin mostly reclaimed by nature. Stench from the rotting wood was quickly replaced with a smell of decomposition, suggesting a gruesome origin. Entering carefully, we discovered a mass of human remains, some recent and others decayed beyond recognition. Mark and I shook our heads in horror at this sickening discovery. Minutes turned into hours as we combed the area around the cabin for more clues on what could inflict such carnage. Pausing to recuperate near a massive oak tree, I shared a story of my youth on the family farm. It received a polite chuckle from my companion, and for a brief moment, our tensions eased. Suddenly, we heard Samira's voice crackle through our radio. She whispered urgently that they'd found another body, but this time, it looked like the attacker was still near the scene. Mark and I sprinted back to regroup with our team members. As we reached their location, we saw Samira and Karen hunched over an unidentifiable mass on the ground. The dim light concealed most of the gory detail, but it was evident that whatever attack had done so without mercy. Venturing further into the park's shadows and following tracks left by this unknown adversary became more demanding each passing moment. Knowing that it's necessary but dangerous only fueled our determination. Just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, 
I caught sight of something through my rifle scope that made my blood run cold. An enormous creature towered dangerously close in front of me. Skin covered in patches of fur clung to its bony frame as though it were decomposing alive. Its mouth oozed with saliva as rows of gnarled teeth chattered hungrily. I didn't waste any time. I grabbed Mark's arm and pulled him in the direction of the others, not allowing myself to look back at the monstrous creature lurking behind us. We sprinted back to Samira and Karen, gasping for breath as we tried to explain the danger we had just narrowly escaped. We need to leave now, I shouted. They didn't argue. It was evident from our expressions that something was very wrong. The four of us made our way back to our vehicles as quickly as possible, still reeling from everything that had transpired in such a short amount of time. I glanced back at the dark park entrance one last time before driving out of there at breakneck speed. On our way out, we stopped at the nearest police station and reported our findings. After an extensive interview with authorities and park rangers, it was decided that the area would be closed off to the public until further notice. Over the next few days, everyone involved was on edge, unable to shake the nightmarish image of that creature deep within the park. Its gnarled teeth and patchy fur haunted my dreams every night, leaving me feeling helpless and vulnerable. There was no denying it there was a killer lurking in those woods. The gruesome extent of its actions had finally been uncovered by our team. Still, we had no idea what kind of animal could inflict such carnage. It wasn't something any of us had ever come across before in all our years investigating strange occurrences. As days turned into a week, word started to spread among locals about a savage creature hiding in the shadows of their once tranquil park. Something needed to be done in order to protect people from this menace. Local hunting experts were called upon along with experienced trackers who formed search teams tasked with locating and neutralizing this threat. A couple of days later, local news reported that they discovered another set of tracks, which only amplified the panic growing within our community. Among the reports, there was talk of a large bear or perhaps even a pack of feral dogs terrorizing the area. However, none of these explanations could adequately account for the disturbing appearance of the creature we'd seen with our own eyes. Reality finally hit home when we heard that a young couple had been brutally attacked on their way to a campsite near where we'd originally discovered the horrible scene. The woman had died at the scene while her partner sustained severe injuries and was being treated at a nearby hospital. The awful news left all of us in shock and despair. The memory of the innocent laughter Karen shared as they examined evidence earlier that night sent a chill down my spine. What had started as an exciting investigation into mysterious circumstances had transformed into something much more sinister. Our everyday lives went on but none of us could forget that horrific ordeal. The days bled into one another, each one filled with more mistrust and fear than the last. We found solace in staying out of nature, away from any wooded areas or parks. We felt safest surrounded by concrete and steel places where creatures like that shouldn't be able to hide. Months later, it happened again another body found ripped apart in a different park miles away from the original site. Just like before, its remains were mutilated almost beyond recognition. My phone rang incessantly as Mark called to discuss what this new finding meant for us and our investigation. Sirens blared in my head at the mention of another gruesome death due to some nightmarish entity hiding in plain sight. In the end... We never saw that creature again, nor did anyone else have encounters with it after that ill-fated investigation. While it eventually turned into whispers between locals and curious visitors alike, its lingering presence reminded us all just how tenuous our connection to safety could be amidst the unknown. Now, when I visit my old family farm, 
I can't help but glance cautiously into the surrounding woods. I remind myself of Mark's reassuring chuckle that night by the oak tree and wonder if we were ever really safe from the horrors that exist around us. The gruesome reality of what transpired will forever weigh heavily within our minds, a chilling reminder of the carnage inflicted upon innocent lives by a creature whose very existence remains shrouded in a nightmare of bloodshed and mystery. I'm Richard. My breath fogged the air around me as I stepped out of the van and onto a desolate sandy beach in Montauk, New York. I was working with a specialized task force, tracking down and hunting monsters that threatened our society. Our team consisted of Sarah, an intelligent analyst, and Jack, who knew perfectly how to handle any weapon in any situation. We were on a secret mission handed to us by our higher-ups that had me feeling quite skeptical of our world's hidden dangers. The sun was sinking behind the tree line, casting dancing shadows across the sand as Richard spoke in hushed tones. So, we're here because of reports about missing persons and some ferocious attacks on locals. Sarah added to what Jack said. Yeah, this is not the first time something like this happened. Remember Cincinnati? Jack chuckled at that mention. How could I forget? That time was crazy. I wiped beads of sweat forming on my forehead, thinking about my upcoming wedding anniversary. I missed spending time with my lovely wife and two amazing kids back home. Silence enveloped us for a moment until we heard footsteps coming from the brush nearby. As we approached the thicket, we found traces of claw marks through the undergrowth. The scratches were uneven, suggesting a creature unlike any we've encountered before, a grotesque animalistic predator that had been attacking locals. We tried to piece together what might have occurred here. To our surprise, Sarah discovered an abandoned campsite, smothered campfire ashes still emitting a faint smell of smoke and belongings strewn about. We should examine those, Richard said as he inspected them closely. Our attempt to call for help was hindered by terrible signal reception in the area. In minutes, it became evident that whatever had killed the occupants of this campsite possessed immense strength and brutal determination. Jack tensed up before turning to me and inquiring, If we decide not to run right now, will you have my back? With a wink. Of course, I assured Jack firmly. Our team continued onward, led by the abomination's trail of destruction. The sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky dark hues and casting twisted shadows that only managed to heighten my unease. Soon, we stumbled upon a gruesome sight. A mutilated body was lying in a pool of congealing blood. Jack quickly grabbed his camera to document the scene while Sarah searched for any clues that might point towards the creature. Then, we heard a guttural snarl behind us. My heart raced as I slowly turned around to confront the terror I had only imagined before. Its eyes burned furiously, fangs protruding menacingly from rotten gums. It stood on its muscular hind legs as if mocking our feeble human forms and covered in ragged fur matted with dirt and blood. The creature lunged forward, and we barely had time to react. Richard grabbed a nearby stick, brandishing it like a makeshift weapon. Sarah was already looking for a way out, her eyes scanning the terrain for escape routes. As the creature snarled and advanced, I tried dialing 911 on my phone but managed only intermittent beeps, indicating a weak signal. Guys, I think now's our best chance. Sarah called, pointing towards a narrow path that seemed to lead towards higher ground. We didn't need any more encouragement. We all bolted in the direction she indicated. As we stumbled through the underbrush, looking over our shoulders at the monstrous being pursuing us, Jack tripped on a tree root. 
he yelled out as he crashed to the ground. No! I cried, reaching for him. But before I could help him up, the unspeakable creature was upon him. Its powerful jaws clamped down on his leg as he screamed in agony. There was no time to save him. Jack's screams echoed through the forest. We have to keep moving! Richard grabbed my arm, pulling me away from the gruesome sight of our friend being mauled by the monster. Tears streaming down my face, I allowed myself to be prodded forward. We ran without looking back until we came across a small cabin hidden deep in the woods. The door was unlocked and creaked open with ease. Relief washed over us as we locked ourselves in. What do we do now? I asked between gasps of air. We can't wait here forever, Sarah replied quietly. Richard nodded solemnly. We need to alert someone about what's happening and bring people here who can deal with that thing. He stared at all of our phones sadly. None of them had any reception inside the cabin either. An idea struck me. Maybe there's a landline. We searched the cabin hastily, feeling a mixture of hope and desperation. To our immense relief, we found an old landline phone hanging on one wall. I hesitated before picking it up, remembering Jack's last moments. As I dialed 911, my hands shook uncontrollably. The operator answered promptly, and I relayed everything we had witnessed as calmly as I could, from the abandoned campsite to the monstrous creature attacking locals, leaving out no detail. The operator assured us that help was on its way and advised us to stay put in the cabin until their arrival. Hours passed and fear gradually gave way to exhaustion. We sat around a makeshift fire we had built inside the cabin, holding on to each other for comfort. When we heard distant sirens, relief flooded through us. Our ordeal would soon be over. The police arrived at the cabin with a team of armed officers prepared to confront any threat imaginable, but none of them had ever encountered a beast like this one before. They listened intently as we recounted our nightmarish experience and took detailed notes. Fortunately, they were equipped with tracking equipment that allowed them to pinpoint the general area where the creature might be hiding. As they prepared to hunt it down, we were taken back to town under guard. During our return journey, Sarah couldn't help but speculate. Could it have been some kind of animal that somehow mutated or evolved in some bizarre way? There have been cases of creatures developing strange adaptations because of environmental factors. I couldn't help but shudder at the thought. It didn't feel natural in any sense, but knowing there was potential scientific explanation did offer a tiny speck of comfort. We later learned that the police tracked down and killed what they called an unknown species similar to a bear or big cat. It wasn't ordinary. Its fur was denser and darker than anything they'd seen before. Officials closed off the area as biologists and researchers swarmed to analyze the remains of the frightening creature. The trauma our group had faced changed us forever. We mourned Jack and found solace in remembering all the good times we had shared with him. Unlike many mysteries, there were no poetic answers or revelations, only fragmented theories. We were left with unsettling questions about what that creature was, where it came from, and whether there may be more of them out there, lurking in the shadows. My name is Alexei Kozlov, and I was standing in a dense, foggy forest just outside Chernobyl, Ukraine. The sun had disappeared beneath the trees, casting long shadows that stretched deep into our surroundings. I worked for an elite task force that hunted and tracked monsters. My team assembled around me. The burly Jakub draws with a firm grip on his rifle and the nimble Zaneta Vankova who carried various tracking equipment. 
We walked cautiously through the trees, following a trail of peculiar tracks. As we ventured deeper into the forest, we discovered a mutilated deer carcass that seemed to be an artistic feast for some creature. We exchanged nervous glances but continued our search. Alexei, do you think it could be a werewolf? asked Sonetta, her tone revealing her doubts about this mythological possibility. No, I replied firmly. But something animalistic has been lurking in these woods for generations. And now we're here to stop it. As we pressed forward, Jakob spotted more strange marks upon the trees, unlike anything he'd ever seen before. It was clear we were dealing with something monstrous and unpredictable. Jakob whispered quietly under his breath that his father had once shared a story of a mysterious beast living deep within the forest, something he had never taken seriously, until now. We soon stumbled across eerie signs of campfires and makeshift shelters scattered throughout the area. This clearly indicated human activity, though no known people were supposed to reside this deep in the woods. Not far from one of these makeshift shelters lay an abandoned phone on the ground. It wasn't ringing for help or signal receivable seemingly due to the remoteness of our location. A sudden screeching noise split through the quiet air around us. We froze in our tracks as new fear surged through our veins like lightning. Cautiously, we moved, drawn almost irresistibly towards the source of that chilling sound and not too far from us found a cavern that seemed to have been carved into the earth by sinister claws. The vines leading into the dark entrance sways, suggesting that whatever made those tracks had recently disappeared inside. Our breaths caught in our throats as we contemplated what to do next. Jakob took the first brave step, flashlight in hand, as we followed him down into the shadowy depths. My mind couldn't help but drift back to my wife Leona and our two young children, wondering if I'd ever get to see them again after this harrowing ordeal. As we descended further into the abyss, our anticipation increased with every echoing footstep. Hearing rustling deep within the cavern, we turned a corner, and there it was, a bizarre creature whose grotesque appearance struck terror in our hearts. The creature stood on two legs, covered in thick, matted fur, with a twisted arrangement of bones and muscles that barely resembled anything familiar. Its eyes were yellow, burning like hot coals as it glared at us with a mix of malice and curiosity. Its long claws seemed to sharpen themselves as they scraped against the cave floor. Jakob grabbed me and whispered in my ear, We need to get out of here. Now. I nodded in agreement with the thought of our families urging us forward. We slowly began to backtrack through the cave, trying to remain as quiet as possible. However, the creature must have heard our movements because it let out another screeching noise that felt like it pierced our souls. As we picked up pace through the caverns, it followed us. It seemed to move effortlessly through the underground network, always staying one step behind us but never quite catching up. We couldn't shake off the creature or outpace it. At one point, Jakob tripped over a protruding rock and fell. Fear gripped me as I realized that stopping to help him could be fatal for both of us. However, leaving him was not an option either. I pulled him back onto his feet, and we continued our desperate flight. Eventually, we reached a smaller cave and blocking our exit. Jakob urged me on. If we didn't make it out of this place soon, surely the creature would catch up and execute its grim intentions upon us. We managed to break free some rocks from the entrance. An opening just big enough for us to squeeze through emerged and we wriggled out into open air, a priceless relief, only to find ourselves at the edge of a ravine with no obvious way down. Call for help, Jakob gasped between breaths. We tried using the abandoned phone we had found earlier, but as expected no signal could be found. We were far too deep in the forest to hope that anyone would hear our calls. 
in one simultaneous stroke of luck and misfortune, we found a rope hanging from a nearby tree intended for someone's earlier rock-climbing adventures. We seized the opportunity, tying it around nearby tree trunks, praying they would hold our weights. We began the perilous descent to the bottom of the ravine. Suddenly, the rope snapped, and we fell to the ground with a pain-numbing thud. Jakob had broken his leg upon landing. I could feel my arm dislocated, but my first priority became finding someplace safe for Jakob so I could search for help. A gnarled but sturdy tree provided a spot with decent camouflage where we could hide Jakob from any prying eyes of that creature. Despite his protests, I left my friend there and began making my way toward what I thought was the direction we came into this damned forest. Hours passed as I struggled through thick underbrush and navigated treacherous terrain. The sun began to set before I saw any signs of civilization, a road or pathway offering hope. I flagged down a car passing by and pleaded for their help. They let me use their phone to call authorities as well as Leona to let her know what had happened and that Jakob needed assistance as well. The police and an ambulance arrived soon after, listening to our story skeptically but searching for Jakob nonetheless. Their rescue dogs managed to pick up his scent, leading us back into those cursed woods. Amazingly, they found him alive, still hidden in his hiding spot beneath the gnarled tree roots. We thanked every deity we knew for looking out for him that day, even though fate hadn't been so kind earlier in our ordeal. Jakub was rushed to a hospital for surgery while I was treated for my dislocated arm. After everything that happened, it was hard to settle back into daily life. Jakob spent months in therapy to regain full function of his leg. We relived the horrors when telling our story to authorities, newspapers, and anyone else who would listen. Speculation around what kind of creature it could have been arose, perhaps an escaped wild animal, or a mutated biological experiment gone wrong. Hopefully, we would never know. Both my family and Jakob's were grateful to have us back and not become victims of the creature that hunted us. Grateful none of us had lost our lives that fateful day. I nervously adjusted my backpack as I walked into the dense woods of Aokigahara, Japan. My name is Tatsuo Hayashi, and I am part of a secret task force that specializes in hunting and tracking monsters. Today's mission was to investigate a series of mysterious disappearances and murders in the area. This was my first time in Aokigahara, and the somber reputation of the place made me feel uneasy. As my fellow team members, Itsuki and Eiji, followed closely behind me, we noticed a group of police officers hovering around something. They guided us to a gruesome sight, a mutilated corpse with an eerie, twisted expression on its face. Already something felt completely off about this case. We continued to search for clues when we discovered scratch marks on nearby trees. Eiji, experienced in tracking creatures, suggested we follow the markings deeper into the forest. The farther we went, the thicker the fog became. Our voices seemed to be swallowed by the mist, leaving an unsettling silence in its place. I tried to lift everyone's spirits with a little joke. At least it's not raining, but no one laughed. We soon found an abandoned campsite with its tent ripped open from the outside. There were signs of struggle, broken branches, scattered belongings but no sign of anyone who'd been there. We guessed they were probably among the missing persons. I shared details about my life with Itsuki and Eiji as we walked, my poor upbringing in a remote village, my love for horror stories, my passion for joining this task force. 
The conversation helped distract us from the fact that something horrible had happened here and brought us closer together as a team. Suddenly, we all froze when we heard rustling near a nearby bush. As we cautiously approached it, an injured man stumbled out, terrified but alive. He introduced himself as Kenichi Harada and claimed that he was attacked by a monstrous creature. His description was chilling. A large, agile beast with dark fur, unnaturally sharp claws, and glowing eyes. With Kenichi joining us, we continued our search for the culprit, picking up the trail of the creature from where he had been attacked. Eiji marveled at how intelligent this beast seemed to be, unlike anything we'd ever encountered before. As night descended upon Eikigahara, my usually skeptical perspective waned in the face of this daunting challenge. The darkness seemed to grow heavier as we moved deeper into the woods. Suddenly, a blood-chilling howl echoed through the forest. The terrifying sound sent shivers down our spines and heightened our sense of unease. Despite our nerves, we knew this might be our only chance to capture or kill whatever was responsible for these atrocities. Armed with guns and knives, we moved stealthily towards the sound. The mist finally cleared as we entered a large clearing. The only source of light came from the shining full moon above us. That's when we saw it. The monstrous creature stood on its hind legs, scarred and mangled from years of surviving in these woods. The beast lunged at us with shocking speed. It took all our instincts just to dodge its powerful swipes. Itsuki bravely fought back, cutting a deep gash across the creature's body with his knife. It howled out in pain but showed no signs of retreat. Eiji swiftly leaped over Kenichi to protect him from an impending attack. He managed to land several gunshots at the creature before being thrown aside like a ragdoll. Run! he yelled, clutching his injuries as blood poured from them. As we scrambled to escape the creature's vicious attacks, we couldn't help but feel a sense of despair. Our weapons seemed to be of little use against this monster that was both cunning and ruthless. I knew we had to focus on getting out of these dark woods if we wanted any chance at survival. Why haven't we called for help? I thought as I ran, my muscles burning with exertion. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. Our cell phones had no signal in the dense forest. We were truly alone, left to the mercy of this relentless predator. The creature was relentless, relentless in its pursuit. It tore through the trees and brush with an animalistic fury that seemed fueled by rage and bloodlust. We tried to split up, hoping that it would confuse the monster and give us a chance to regroup. Itsuki stayed behind for a moment, making sure we were all safely away before taking off in another direction. But our plan didn't work as well as we'd hoped. The monster quickly picked up my scent and continued its pursuit as I dashed through the underbrush, trying hard to slow down my breathing so it wouldn't find me so easily. A heavy thud echoed nearby. Kenichi had tripped over an upturned root and fallen to the ground hard. I quickly doubled back, helping him to his feet as the creature turned its attention towards us once more. I don't think I can run any longer. Kenichi panted, his face pale from fear and exhaustion. We have no choice. I responded firmly. We have to keep moving. Suddenly, Itsuki appeared from behind a tree and threw himself at the creature. He had found a branch on the ground that he now wielded as an improvised weapon. He struck the creature with all his might, causing it to stagger back for a moment. Go! Itsuki yelled, desperation in his voice. I'll hold it off! We hesitated but knew it was our only option, so we took off again with panic desperation the sounds of Itsuki fighting to the death ringing in our ears. I couldn't shake the image of his fierce determination against that beast. It was like watching a lion trying to hold back an avalanche. Eventually, 
we stumbled upon a small cabin nestled within the trees, a miracle in this seemingly endless forest. We barged inside, locking the door and barricading it with whatever furniture we could find. Our hearts were pounding as time ticked away, and no sounds echoed from outside the cabin. As hours went by, we couldn't help but wonder if the creature had lost interest or found another target. Any hope of rescue felt like a distant dream. Finally, the sun began to rise, its feeble rays filtering through the trees. We cautiously emerged from our makeshift stronghold after giving one last thought to Itsuki's bravery and sacrifice. Kenichi struggled to walk on his injured leg, leaning heavily on me for support as Eiji, and I silently carried him out of Aokigahara Forest. Once we were safe, I finally managed to regain my cell phone signal and called for emergency services. Only when the help arrived did they inform us about a particularly aggressive bear that had been terrorizing this area for several months, known for its unusual aggression and intelligence. Many locals believe that it was an angry spirit manifested from within the dark depths of Aokigahara Forest, but others were more pragmatic and assumed it was just an exceptionally ferocious animal. As we were treated for our injuries and brought to safety, I couldn't shake Itsuki's brave face before finally succumbing to nature's relentless law. Only the strong survive. It was at that moment that I swore never to set foot again in Aokigahara Forest or anywhere where monsters might lurk. I am James Thompson, and my work for the Special Hunting Task Force has taken me to the dense forests of Black Forest, Germany. Sitting with my team in our makeshift campsite, we share stories of our lives before joining the force. I talk about how I used to be a teacher, dealing with unruly teenagers instead of monsters. As part of our training, we've had to learn how to identify and memorize fingerprints, teeth marks, and other specific hunting patterns left by certain creatures. Our mission was to find the culprit behind a series of gruesome murders that baffled local police. The killed only left one evidence, mangled bodies in its wake. My fellow team members Barbara Schmitz and Wilhelm Becker have become my closest friends through countless missions and hunts. We've grown accustomed to each other's weaknesses and unique strengths. Barbara with her sharpshooter skills and Wilhelm with his instinctual tracking abilities. We start searching a nearby path where some hikers had gone missing, hoping to find clues that would lead us to the monstrous beast responsible for havoc unleashed. Following the faint bloodstains on the ground, I notice torn clothing stuck on branches ahead. Hey guys, I called them over. I think our poor hiker friend ran into some trouble here. Examining the area further, we quickly realize whatever attacked him wasn't just passing by. It was hunting its prey deliberately. We knew this was no ordinary animal at work here. Our search intensifies as we begin hearing distant screams echoing through the night sky. The all-too-human cries send shivers down our spines as we close in on an old abandoned industrial building hidden within thick foliage. Damn, I hate these places, Wilhelm whispers with a nervous chuckle. We carefully enter the building as darkness engulfs us, our flashlights barely illuminating the eerie structure. Shadows seem alive as they dance across walls while the smell of decay overwhelms our senses. Walking further in, we come across numerous gruesome scenes, dismembered bodies scattered all around, showing the sinister work of the monster we seek. Barbara suddenly draws to a halt, causing us to follow suit. Her finger pointed towards something that would change our lives forever, a horrific creature, barely resembling anything we had ever witnessed. The beast is tall with long limbs and twisted, hunched posture, 
its skin rotten and green in hue as clusters of jagged bones protrude from its grotesque form. The thing doesn't even acknowledge our presence as it greedily devours entrails ripped from one of its victims. The blood-splattered floor and scraps of torn flesh announced this monster was responsible for the missing people's fates. Reluctantly, Wilhelm and I follow behind Barbara who approaches the creature silently, her rifle raised and ready to strike if needed. But she is halted by a raised hand from me. We can't risk losing it, I whisper urgently. Let's try to regroup and plan out how to contain it. Relaying this information back to headquarters, we gather reinforcements and surround the building while maintaining a safe distance. Our teammates Nathan Peterson and Deborah Altman join us with specialized capturing equipment designed to make quick work of creatures like these. Gradually covering exits one by one without alerting the monster inside, our team readies for an imminent showdown. Suiting up for protection against potential injuries from this adversary, tension runs high as fear courses through our veins, every heart pounding tremendously in anticipation. I brace myself for the inevitable confrontation and recount my days being just a simple teacher worried about grading papers while missing my family, a sharp contrast to where I find myself now. Even though deep inside me resides fear for what comes next, I am prepared. As Nathan slowly begins lifting the heavy steel door on our signal, with Deborah and Barbara ready to shoot wires and nets into the creature, my years of training come flashing back. I know what must be done. Taking a deep breath, I lead my team further into the madness as we dive headfirst into the conflict against an unimaginable foe. The heavy steel door creaks open, and I lead my team inside the dimly lit building. The air feels stale, thick with tension and the stench of death. Our steps echo softly as we move forward, our eyes scanning every corner for movement. Suddenly, the creature lunges at us from the shadows. It has a sickly appearance, with mottled skin and limbs that seem unnaturally long and twisted. Its mouth is filled with jagged teeth, capable of tearing flesh with ease. Instinctively, I yell out a warning to my teammates. Nathan, Deborah, Barbara, get down! I shout as the monster barrels towards us. Without hesitation, Nathan and Deborah fire their capturing devices trying to ensnare the creature in a web of wires and nets. Meanwhile, Barbara focuses on maintaining a safe distance for our team while holding her rifle at the ready. The creature snarls in fury as it struggles against its bindings, its sharp claws slashing at anything within reach. Amidst the chaos, Nathan comes up with a plan. Let's lure it outside where we have more space to confront it, he suggests urgently. The team agrees, carefully maneuvering the trapped monster towards the exit while avoiding any direct contact with its claws. During this process, Nathan suffers a deep gash to his leg from a swipe of vicious talons. Deborah quickly helps him cover the wound with gauze to stem the bleeding. Outside, we position ourselves around the creature so that there's no room for it to escape. I remember that I still have my phone in my pocket. Now would be an excellent opportunity to call for help. I dial 911 and describe our location and details about the aggressive creature we've trapped. As we continue our battle against the relentless predator, dread fills me as I think about that moment when we first saw this thing responsible for mutilating its victims. The gore and violence of its actions will never leave our memories, even if we can successfully capture it today. Drenched in sweat, we continue to contain the beast as it thrashes against its bindings. My mind races what if we won't be able to hold it for long enough to receive help. However, I push away doubt and focus on doing everything I can to ensure my team makes it out of this unharmed. Finally, Police sirens approach our location, signaling that reinforcements are close at hand. 
while several officers attempt to offer assistance, the creature seems to be growing weaker from the constant struggle against its restraints. To my relief, a containment vehicle arrives shortly after them, and escape from this nightmare now feels possible. I remember the dead and mutilated faces of the monster's victims. I cannot allow this nightmare to continue for anyone else. Amid exhaustion and pain, we work together with the officers to restrain and transfer the creature into their containment vehicle. As the waiting vehicle's doors shut on our captured foe, I watch the sun start to rise over a new day. The adrenaline slowly leaves my body, replaced by emotional and physical exhaustion. Hopelessness washes over me as I think about how many people had already fallen victim to this beast's rampage. Nothing can erase that heartache. In the days that follow, Nathan's leg injury is treated and healing rapidly. Deborah, Barbara, and I visit him in the hospital as we all try to recover from our harrowing experience together. The authorities never classify what species or origin the creature may be. However, everyone involved knows that such horrors are likely lurking elsewhere in this world, unimaginable creatures with an insatiable appetite for destruction still waiting for their chance to strike. As we return back to our lives haunted by the wounds inflicted upon us that night, each passing moment acts as a reminder of how fleeting safety can be. All we can do now is take solace in the fact that we were able to prevent any more innocent lives from being gruesomely cut short by this monster's wrath. For some, it might not feel like enough, but for others, it could very well be the difference between life and death. I'm Silas Johnson, standing in Redwood National Park, California. The dense forest loomed all around me as I stared at the task force assembled in front of me. Our mission was simple locate and eliminate the creature that had been terrorizing locals and tourists alike. The team consisted of Graham Kessler, our experienced tracker, the analytical sister duo of Jasmine and Evelyn Hughes, Andres Rios, who was a former police officer, and me. We had been through grueling training together and shared an unbreakable bond in this monster hunting task force. Our investigation led us to a small cabin hidden deep within the park. It belonged to Harold Buckley, a man who disappeared without a trace about a week ago. His disappearance marked the third case this month and with locals on edge, time was of the essence. As we cautiously approached the cabin, we noticed the door hanging open on its hinges. My heart raced as I stepped inside. The wooden floors creaked beneath us, revealing an eerie silence that lingered throughout. Graham whispered with concern pointing towards scratch marks that adorned the walls. These aren't normal bear scratches. They're deeper calculated. What could make those? I questioned. Graham shook his head in uncertainty. As he scanned the remains of Harold's belongings scattered about the room, he responded quietly yet with authority. I don't know yet, but we need to find out soon. It was then when we began work in tracking down this enigmatic predator together. While searching deeper into the woods over the course of several hours— it became evident that this creature was unlike anything we had encountered before. In fact, it seemed intelligent careful with its tracks but sloppy in its destruction. Soon enough, Graham discovered something unsettling, bloody remnants leading to recently unearthed human bones. As we all stood in shock taking in our findings amidst this beautiful surrounding landscape turned gruesome backdrop. I shared some of my personal background with the team. My father used to work as a police officer and told stories of missing people from these woods, people who were never found. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine we would find them. The team remained silent, understandably stunned by this revelation. 
While tracking the creature, we stumbled upon a lair that became clearer as we progressed. As we hesitated outside the lair's entrance, Jasmine spoke in hushed tones. Do you think it was hunting those people? I reasoned logically, still skeptical. It's possible. The evidence points toward a predator with intention. Andres, chiming in with a whisper, added, If we don't stop this thing now, who knows how many more lives it could take. As we ventured further into the lair of this untamed beast, the stench of decay became overwhelming. Suddenly, Evelyn noticed an obscure shape within the darkness of the cave not man nor machine. Its unnatural presence sent shivers down our spine's ghastly eyes reflected fear back at us from every angle. With heightened alertness and senses razor-sharp, trouble approached faster than an extinguished candle still glowing in the dark. The shadows began to shift and move rapidly, their body seemingly altered and unclear to the point where it was nearly unrecognizable but highly dangerous. Jasmine attempted to fire her weapon at its form that darted alongside cave walls gracefully evading each shot. Suddenly the creature lunged at us with speed unlike anything humans are capable of comprehending or anticipating. All five of us quickly dispersed into different directions within the cave to avoid its vicious strike, but not Evelyn. She wasn't quick enough as it grabbed her with ferocious intensity before escaping into the night. Paralyzed by fear, guilt gnawed at me as I realized even our advanced training wasn't enough to protect us. The creature's brutal undeniable existence prompted us to call for reinforcements, evacuation even. But here, miles from any civilization, no signal was possible to make contact. Just as panic began to set in, we heard Evelyn scream as the creature carried her through the forest. Determined to save our comrade, we chased after the sound fueled by adrenaline and an unwavering resolve. We could not let this creature win. We sprinted through the forest, following the sound of Evelyn's screams. The noise of her pain and terror pushed us to move faster disregarding our own safety in the pursuit of saving our friend. Our breathing grew heavy as fatigue set in, but we refused to slow or give up. We found ourselves running into a clearing where the sounds of Evelyn's anguish were suddenly silenced. There, we spotted the creature as it held her limp body in its large, grotesque claws. The beast was unlike anything we had ever seen before. Standing at least seven feet tall, covered in dark, matted fur, and equipped with razor-sharp teeth that were stained with Evelyn's blood. It looked at us with its cold, black eyes and snarled menacingly. We realized then that there was no chance for any hope of calling for help. The creature would kill us all before any backup could arrive. The creature swiftly dragged Evelyn's unconscious body further into the shadows and it was gone before we could muster a plan of action. We knew it was too dangerous to pursue without help or weapons but couldn't abandon our comrade to this monstrous beast. Though calling for help wasn't an option before, we tried once more. Frantically searching for a signal on our devices, we desperately hoped that luck would be on our side this time. Miraculously, one bar appeared on my screen and I quickly dialed for reinforcements. As my call connected I shouted directions and warned them about the vicious beast haunting these woods. Our team stayed put until reinforcements arrived. They brought additional weapons and equipment to combat this new threat. Tracker dogs were unleashed to locate Evelyn and capture the creature. We ventured deep into the forest once more this time closely guiding by trackers who followed evidence left behind by our captured comrade and her captor. As we advanced carefully through the woods, a repulsive smell hit us. Something was here, dead, but it wasn't Evelyn. We discovered the mutilated bodies of two of the tracking dogs. Our hearts ached for them, and we grew more furious with every step. In a dark and dense spot deep in the ancient forest, 
where no sun nor sounds penetrated, we finally found Evelyn. She lay on the cold ground covered in scratches and bite marks. She was alive but unable to move due to her injuries. Paramedics treated her immediately, but our focus shifted towards the creature which seemed to have vanished entirely, leaving no trace for us to follow. We didn't want this monster wreaking any more havoc on innocent lives. Suddenly, the trackers shouted that they had found something, a hidden lair. With newfound confidence and fury pushing us forward, we entered the creature's den. The floor was slick with blood, gore smeared on walls and bones scattered around. The putrid smell assaulted our senses as we continued deeper into the lair. From one dark corner emerged a terrifying snarl echoing off cave walls, followed by those chilling black eyes reflecting back at us. The beast lunged for us. However, this time, we were better prepared. Opening fire at the creature with powerful tranquilizer darts, we finally managed to subdue it. As it lay unconscious on the ground, we could examine it closely. Covered in matted fur with its massive claws retracted, this thing was genuinely terrifying even in an unconscious state. Seemingly no ordinary animal or monster we knew or could name, only assumptions based on its appearance would explain its origins. Its body was lifted carefully with great care taken not to stir the beast from its slumber. Scientists later examined it in understanding its species and origins, codenamed Juggernaut as an example of evolution's darker sides, stronger and more vicious than anything recorded before. In one gruesome instant we learned the hard truth humans are not always at the top of the food chain. Evelyn recovered slowly, but the memory of her encounter still haunted her dreams. The creature's lair and remnants were destroyed, but we wondered deep down whether there were more of them, lurking in the shadows, waiting for their next prey. I'm Emmett O'Bannon, standing outside the dense forest surrounding the town of Erisland. Today, I feel lucky to be a part of Special Task Force Sigma, devoted to hunting and tracking down monsters. During my childhood, I grew up listening to stories about creatures hiding in the shadows. Back then, I never thought I'd make a career out of confronting those fears. We planned a secret mission deep into the woods after several locals had gone missing and gruesome crime scenes were discovered, different from anything we'd seen before. The air hung heavy with unease as our diverse team of experts made its way through thick underbrush. Our team leader, Ulysses Sharp, turned and said, Remember, folks, whatever we're facing out here is unlike anything we've encountered before. Stay sharp, stay focused. A faint chuckle followed his words. As we moved deeper into the forest, we stumbled upon a horrific scene stripped bones, and remains of one of the missing persons lay strewn about the ground. It became real for all of us then. The danger wasn't just in our imagination or whispered local legends. My fellow task force members listened intently as I detailed what we were looking at without using technical jargon and essential skill on this skill-diverse team. They understood that this was more than a mindless killing spree. There was an almost methodical destruction at work here. Hours passed as we tracked whatever committed these acts through the woods until dusk began to settle. And that's when it happened, our first contact with the antagonist. Partially hidden behind some bushes just a few meters away, lay this beast. Its sharp claws covered in filth, and dried blood glistened in the dying rays of sunlight. Its hideous body pulsed with power as it let forth an unnerving growl. I don't recall ever feeling so small and insignificant while looking into its hollow, malevolent eyes. The creature moved around, giving us the chance to observe it. 
The form resembled some twisted combination of animal and human, yet it was something entirely different from both. Ulysses, with sweat pouring down his brow, whispered instructions. The tension among us was palpable. Each of us carefully tightened our grips on the guns we carried. We aimed for the creature's heart, desperate to end this nightmare before it could hurt any more people. The beast spotted us and charged at an impossible speed. My fellow team members yelled in response but couldn't call for help as they focused everything on fighting the horror in front of them. A violent dance began with us leaping out of the path of those deadly claws and desperately firing our weapons. Our training had prepared us for a lot of things but not this. As the battle raged on, I couldn't help but recall the emotions surging through me during my first field mission. However, this was another level entirely. As we fought on into the night, I managed to glance around and spot Eamon Quinn lying motionless on the ground nearby my friend and skilled shooter whose grin could make everyone around him laugh. Shrouded in darkness and pain, I could only imagine what torment he had gone through only moments ago. We screamed for help, but there was none to be had, no one to come and save us from the nightmarish creature before us. As I dodged its relentless attacks, I feared that our communications were intercepted. What if this creature could tamper with our signals, rendering us helpless and isolated? Desperation gnawed at me as bullets flew through the air. The conflict raged for what felt like an eternity. We defended ourselves as best as we could, but the creature's agility and raw strength outmatched our trained skills and firepower. One by one, my teammates fell to its unyielding assault. The creature tore into them with furor while we scrambled to reload and maintain steady aim at its colossal mass. Ulysses gave a futile order. Fall back! Our team retreated, pursued relentlessly by the beast. We stumbled, exhausted and injured, through dark forests and rough terrain. The creature's howls echoed in our ears drowning out any lingering words of hope. As we ran, Ulysses instructed those still able to shoot to cover our retreat. During a momentary reprieve from the onslaught, I mustered enough courage to call for backup but couldn't guarantee they would arrive in time. We continued our escape with dwindling hope. The wounded were tiring faster than those who remained untouched by the creature's attacks, among them myself somehow still untouched by claws or fangs. My own gun was nearly spent, ammunition running low with each frantic burst of gunfire as we ran from an enemy that refused to falter. Suddenly aware that our efforts were not enough to stop the attacks, Ulysses made a final decision. He told me and a few others, Get out of here! Find a way to lead it away and rendezvous with backup further down. Knowing there was only one way to stop the creature for now, diversion, I volunteered to lure the beast away. A handful of us, including Ulysses, broke off from the main group, and with as much bravado as my rifle could produce, we opened fire on the creature. The plan worked, gaining its attention by diverting fire towards it and blinding it momentarily with a flash grenade. We led the enraged beast on a chase away from our comrades. I didn't look back as Ulysses and I sprinted forward, struggling to stay ahead of those blood-curdling sounds. Finally, after what felt like miles of agonizing pursuit and unrelenting fear, reinforcements arrived in armored vehicles, armed to the teeth with weaponry designed for more robust targets than any human could ever be. As they unloaded upon the monster that pursued us, their military-grade artillery tore into it. I watched as the creature writhed in pain from the barrage but continued to fight fiercely. Eventually, one shot found purchase in its head. The impact caused it to stagger and eventually collapse. The nightmare was over. We stood motionless heaving breaths mingling with relief and disbelief that we had survived this harrowing encounter. 
However, there was no time for celebration. My thoughts turned to Eamon Quinn and our other fallen teammates. Their bravery fueled our drive for survival. While experts tried to identify what exactly the beast was, they remained stumped. They assumed it might have been some mutated monstrosity or undiscovered species but couldn't confirm without significant study, a luxury not afforded by our immediate circumstances. Amen and the others deserved better than this nightmare. We carried them out of that awful place and made sure they were remembered for their courage against an indescribable horror none could have prepared for or anticipated. As we drove away from that cursed forest, I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever happened next would change us and how we face the world. It was no longer just humans and animals. It was something else entirely, a darkness none of us knew existed and we had stared into its eyes. I'm Simon, standing in the dense woods outside Sleepy Hollow, New York. My colleagues, she's Elvilda and he's Orestes, and I are tasked with tracking a creature that's been causing mayhem in this area. We're part of a task force that specializes in hunting monsters, but this one's new to us. Triple check everything, Alvilda says as we inspect our gear. The three of us exchange nods and murmurs of confirmation. Our secret mission starts with locals reporting a string of gruesome incidents, people missing, others found mauled or worse. Every scene is a masterwork of carnage, beyond what most animals could do. I recall why I joined the task force, the death of my sister Elsworth at the hands of a creature we never caught. I draw strength from her memory. Delving deeper into the trees, our senses strained for any clues, I can't help but crack a joke. You'd think with all the Starbucks around here, the creatures would be too relaxed to hunt. Alvilda smirks. Orestes just shakes his head. Later that day, we stumble upon evidence, large tracks leading toward a cave hidden under an old oak tree. The prints are different, bigger and more aggressive than anything we've seen before. We should call for backup, suggests Orestes with furrowed brows. No time, I reply, thinking of the innocent lives at stake. Whatever this creature is, it won't stop until we make it. Inside the cave reeks of rotting flesh and fresh blood. Then we see it, a nest made from gnarled bones and ripped flesh. It seems this creature has quite the collection. Suddenly, we hear a guttural growl emanating from deeper inside. We proceed silently but cautiously into the heart of darkness. Out of nowhere emerges our target, an enormous, beast-like creature, with razor-sharp claws and horns protruding from its skull. Its eyes are vacant yet full of rage. Our training kicks in. We spread out and swiftly open fire using our specially developed anti-monster weapons. But this creature seems unaffected. It leaps toward Orestes, pinning him to the ground in a shower of rocks and dust. Help! he yells, struggling under the overwhelming weight of the creature. In an attempt to save him, Alvilda distracts it with a well-timed shot while I hastily perform first aid on Orestes. The creature roars again as its eyes dart between us, deciding who to attack next. What now? asks Alvilda, panting. Finish the mission. I say between fast breaths. The creature lunges at us. We dodge and weave amidst flying debris and the crash of shattering splintered wood as we fire back at it. Able to move only with incredible pain, Orestes roars his fury at having been injured by this new foe. Don't worry, I tell him. I won't let what happened to Elsworth happen to anyone else. As the creature lunges toward us again, Alvilda manages to hit a weak spot on its body. It screeches in pain but quickly recovers and decides to target me. 
I barely dodged the assault, feeling a sharp pain course through my body as one of its claws grazes my arm. We continue fighting with little progress. Our shots keep bouncing off its monstrous hide and our injuries begin to pile up. Finally, I realize we're not going to win this without help. Call for reinforcements. I yell as Alvilda and I separate to avoid the creature's next attack. Why didn't we do that before? She asks in exasperation as she retrieves her radio. We didn't expect it to be this strong. I reply, wincing at the pain in my arm as I prepare my weapon again. Alvilda quickly gets on the line with our commander, requesting immediate backup. The creature snarls and, sensing our vulnerability, closes in on our position. There is nothing left for us but to stall for time until reinforcements arrive. Orestes struggles beside me, pushing through the pain of his injuries to try and stand. He understands that he might be a liability at this juncture. However, his pride prevents him from staying down. In tandem with Alvilda's continued assault on the creature, Orestes and I manage to find a rhythm between us. He distracts it with a few well-aimed shots while I strike it from another angle. The plan works for a while but isn't enough to cause any significant damage. It seems like an eternity before we finally hear distant footsteps echoing through the darkness. Through labored breaths, we muster our last ounces of strength and continue the fight. However, as soon as our backup arrives, a team of six heavily armed soldiers, they struggle just like us to make sense of which tactics might be effective. The commander quickly calls for a tactical retreat upon understanding the gravity of the situation. It becomes clear that none of us are prepared to handle this beast right now. We pack up everything we can, carrying our injured comrades, and retreat out the way we came. The creature doesn't follow us, perhaps satisfied with the damage it had already inflicted. Back at our base, we regroup and strategize. Medical personnel tend to Orestes and me, while Alvilda reports our encounter to the higher-ups. The room fills with grim expressions and heavy sighs this wasn't how any of us saw this mission ending. But in truth, it's far from over. Days pass as we recover from our injuries. We pour ourselves into researching the creature, scouring every database for an inkling as to what it might be and how to stop it. While most of us had no experience with folklore or cryptic species, some of our colleagues bring forward a few obscure leads, tales of monsters morphing into terrifying forms or mythological beings whose appearances inspire terror in their enemies. Unfortunately, nothing solid emerges from our research. Defeated but not despairing, we're determined not to let what happened to Elsworth happen again. Those we've lost deserve justice and all those innocent people who may cross paths with this monster deserve better than to suffer at its hands. A week later, armed with new intel, improved weapons designed specifically to bring down powerful creatures, and a determination not seen since the beginning of our mission, we revisit the lair where so much devastation occurred just days prior. This time, Though still apprehensive about facing the mysterious beast once more, an air of quiet resolve gives us hope that we will succeed today. The creature still resides in that dark abode of death, seemingly waiting for our return. As it raises its head and sees us coming, its eyes spark with rage. This time, however, we're ready. We have no idea whether we'll survive this encounter or not. But for those who've fallen, we owe it to them to forge ahead and do everything we can to ensure the creature pays for its actions. Steeled for battle, we charge forward, determined to put an end to the monstrous being that has hounded and haunted us for too long. The grim memory of the tragic events serves as fuel for our drive and willpower as we move forward together as a unified force, intent on delivering justice or dying in the attempt.
I'm Jack, standing among the dense trees of Mississippi's DeSoto National Forest. The air feels heavy, burdened by the scent of damp earth and decaying leaves. Even though I can't put my finger on it yet, something feels off. In a hushed voice, I talk about my childhood growing up in a small town where everyone knew each other. Years ago, I joined a secret task force committed to hunting down monstrous creatures. As the leader of this team, I've seen things that would make anyone's skin crawl. Our current mission, track and eliminate a dangerous creature that's been stalking travelers passing through the forest. As we investigate further, we begin to stumble upon gruesome discoveries. Mutilated bodies strung up in trees and disturbing messages written in blood. Gradually, tension mounts among our team while we continue to collect disturbing evidence. Quiet conversations in the thick shadows reveal our growing worries. We reinforce these dialogues with dark humor, making subtly outrageous jokes to try to ease the building intensity. You can feel that something sinister is approaching as the sun sinks lower and day fades into night. The first contact with our antagonist comes when one of our teammates spots an enormous claw mark gouged into the bark of a towering pine tree. Nerves are frayed as fear begins to seep in. None of us have ever encountered a creature quite like this one before. The monster is enormous and terrifyingly fast-moving yet stealthy, making it almost impossible for us to track its movements effectively. We quickly realize that it doesn't fit the description of any known animal or creature. It's like a horrifying amalgamation of various vicious beasts. Razor-sharp claws adorn its limbs, and its spine-rippling growls seem to shake the very foundations of our souls. As dusk deepens into total darkness, one by one, members of our group begin to vanish— picked off by an unseen predator that seems increasingly omnipotent. It becomes apparent that the creature is not just hunting us. It's playing with us in sadistic glee. I haven't had a chance to call for backup, and the realization dawns that whatever this monster is, it doesn't want external interference. It wants to keep its twisted game contained in this desolate forest. The surviving team members scramble through the trees, desperately trying to comprehend what they're up against. The mysterious creature is always one step ahead of them, blurring the line between predator and prey. Attempts at combat are futile as bullets fail to pierce its thick hide, and it retaliates by mauling another teammate. Now we've found ourselves in a desperate race against time not just for our survival but also to uncover the truth behind this beast and learn what twisted force has brought it into existence. All the while, the creature continues to inflict its gruesome reign of terror in increasingly horrifying ways. Panic has set in now as my team dwindles in numbers and morale plummets. Paranoia creeps among the survivors— causing some to question whether we'll make it out alive or even if our mission is worth pursuing at all. Trust begins to splinter as we descend further into horrors fathoms deep and untold. As darkness devours hope, I find myself alone and hunted by the monstrous being. Its eerie silence fades only when it's close enough to remind me of my impending doom. Scratching sounds against spark echo through the forest as though taunting me, sending chills down my spine. Will I turn a corner only to find its unnerving gaze upon me? At times it almost seems inevitable. But I won't give up. For my fallen comrades, for my duty, I will keep fighting until my last breath gives way. The creature lurks nearby, an unseen horror that could pounce at any moment and I know that any step could be my last. My team and I found an abandoned cabin, a glimmer of hope in the oppressive darkness of the forest. We barricaded the entrance and any visible openings to keep the creature at bay. The floor creaked with every step, matching the rhythm of the creature's approach. Frustrated on what to do next, 
we decided to split up to increase our chances of finding help or a way out of this nightmare. John and Carol went one way while Lisa, Mark, and I ventured down a different path. We agreed to reunite at the cabin in a few hours or whenever we found something promising. As Lisa, Mark, and I trekked ahead, we heard guttural growls far too close for comfort. We could no longer deny the full gravity of our situation. We were being hunted. Even if we wanted to call for help, there was no means. Our radio had been destroyed during an earlier encounter with the creature. The shadows of the trees seemed to close in on us as we wandered deeper into the forest. A putrid smell wove its way through the branches above. It didn't take long for us to discover its source. We stumbled upon a gruesome scene, an array of corpses mangled beyond recognition, evidence of the creature's latest kills. Shocked by what we saw and realizing time was running out for John and Carol, who failed to meet us back at the cabin, we decided our only option was to look for signs of civilization beyond these menacing woods. As darkness fell once more, whispers from unseen sources circled around Mark, and snaring his thoughts as he continued forward unwarily. Lisa and I tried desperately to pull him back from his fog-like trance but were met with only resistance. Suddenly, Mark sprinted away from us towards an uncertain fate. Determined not to let the creature claim another victim, Lisa and I forged ahead in search of Mark, only to find him suspended in a tree, bound by thick vines with shadows of their own. We called out to him, but he wouldn't answer. This had become the creature's territory. From the gloom emerged the beast itself, a grotesque creature with elongated limbs, razor-sharp claws, and a maw full of sharp teeth. It moved fluidly between the shadows as its eyes fixed on us, its unlucky prey. Paralyzed by fear, we remained still as we witnessed something even more disturbing. The creature was not entirely animal nor human. It resembled both in a twisted mockery of nature. Broken from our trance at the sight of our impending doom, Lisa and I tried to free Mark. Unfortunately, our efforts attracted the creature's undivided attention. It lunged at us, claws extended and mouth wide open. There would be no escape for us this time. But just as certain death seemed inevitable— Mark managed to free himself from his bindings. Distracting the creature with his sudden movements, he drew it away from Lisa and me long enough for us to flee towards salvation. As we ran away from the nightmarish scene unfolding before us, I could hear my friend's screams echoing through the air, knowing all too well that his sacrifice allowed us to live. We journeyed for miles before finally seeking refuge with other survivors. When they asked about our ordeal and how Mark met his end, we hesitated. Could we really convey what we had experienced without sounding insane? We decided to simply share that an unknown beast took Mark's life. Days later, utterly exhausted yet grateful for our survival, or perhaps in honor of those lost along our arduous expedition, Lisa and I recount the dreadful story of our encounter with the beasts born in nightmares, a grotesque combination of humanity and nature that kept us captive in a deadly game. We can only wonder if any semblance of truth can ever reveal the monster's origin, but one thing is certain. With the end of our pursuit, dark shadows continue to lurk in the dense forest waiting for the next unsuspecting souls to wander into their domain. I, Nathaniel Aquel, stood on the damp soil of Aokigahara Forest in Japan. Moss clung to the trees around me as I tightened the straps on my backpack. Our team had responded to a report from the locals of bizarre occurrences, and as a member of an elite task force specializing in hunting and tracking monsters, it was my job to investigate. Our investigation led us to this notorious forest. 
we discovered disturbing evidence straight away. Torn clothing, shattered branches, and even pieces of bone fragments scattered about. My comrades and I meticulously examined the crime scene. Hey boss, you think this might be like that Hannibal guy? One of my compatriots quipped. We dabbled with humor to cope with intense situations like these. Hush now, Malcolm, I replied. Stay sharp. I couldn't help but reflect on how my life had brought me here. As a boy raised by a single mom who worked twice as hard, we barely scraped by. Those struggles drove me into adulthood with a unique determination that benefited me during my military service and now hunting monsters. As we continued following the trail, we stumbled upon an eerie sight, a left-behind campsite littered with abandoned gear, including what seemed to be their last meal still sitting half-eaten on a plate. Roberta Legwin stepped forward cautiously to examine the area further. It's like they just vanished into thin air, she said with confusion dripping in her words. Suddenly there was a loud snap from beyond our sideline, and we all froze in place, weapons at the ready. And then we saw it, an animalistic creature larger than any bear or wolf lumbering through the foliage towards us. Thick fur matted with grime covered its muscular build. Its beady eyes pierced through us while its maw opened wide to reveal rows of razor-sharp teeth positioned for one purpose, tearing flesh from bone. We reached for our weapons to defend ourselves. Sandra Ferenzi, the teen's sharpshooter, took aim while Hank Chastain stood guard. The creature ignored the bullets raining down upon it as it charged towards us. Instead of calling for help, we knew there was no time for reinforcements. We were stranded and outnumbered. The battle waged on as we maneuvered through the tangled forest, fighting tooth and nail for survival. While evading the beast's reach, it was astounding to find it mystifyingly evading our every attack. The tempo of the events accelerated with each strategic move we made. I scrambled up an embankment before finding myself on a ridge overlooking the scene below. Frustration surged through me as I observed how ill-equipped we were for such an adversary. Nate! Get out of sight! Malcolm barked from across the battlefield. The creature lunged at Roberta who fell to the ground just narrowly avoiding its grasp. With heart pounding in my chest, I saw Malcolm throw himself forward driving his combat knife into one of its massive legs. I seized this opportunity and loaded my Glock with silver-tipped bullets, my theory being that perhaps this unknown creature had a weakness much like werewolves did. I squeezed off around just as it bore down upon Malcolm, its fur now streaked with crimson. The silver-infused bullet penetrated its hide. The creature recoiled until it reared itself to face its new target me. Well, got your attention then? I muttered as adrenaline rushed through my veins. In a flash, it charged headlong toward me like a freight train destined for destruction, while my teammates scrambled to regroup and re-engage their enemy before it could reach me. The massive creature barreled towards me, and I knew I had to act quickly. With only seconds to spare, I jumped off the ledge, gripping onto a nearby tree branch as I desperately tried to make my way down. My hope was that the creature would follow my descent and allow my teammates the chance to strike from above, using their remaining ammunition. Nate! Roberta yelled, scrambling to her feet after dodging the monster's attack. Get out of there! Malcolm is distracting it! We need to find a way out of this forest. I complied, hustling my way back to my friends while trying to keep myself hidden among the trees. As we regrouped, we noticed that Malcolm had managed to injure the creature but was also hurt from its razor-sharp claws. Despite our attempts at efficiently communicating with each other and staying hidden from the creature's sight, it became evident that we were struggling mightily and needed help. 
As we faced the possibility of not making it out alive, Roberta decided it was time to call for help. Whipping out her tactical radio, she quickly spoke into it. This is Bravo Team requesting immediate extraction at Delta slash Foxtrot Alpha 7242. Urgent assistance needed. As she sent our plea for help, we continued battling the hideous beast that relentlessly pursued us. It seemed like an eternity since the conflict began, but in truth, only hours had passed. Throughout this ordeal, Malcolm remained oddly quiet and contemplative. Eventually, I managed a private moment with him. What do you think this thing is? I asked in a hushed tone. Malcolm frowned before admitting his uncertainty. I don't know, he whispered back grimly. It's unlike anything I've ever seen or heard of before. Do you think it's some kind of scientific experiment gone wrong? I inquired further my mind racing to find an explanation for such a being's existence. This thought felt more plausible and allowed my mind to resist the filmic options of legendary monsters. Anything is possible, Malcolm replied cautiously. But right now, our priority is getting out of here alive. As we continued our fight against this mysterious creature, we all prayed for relief. Holding on until a rescue operation could arrive, losing teammates wasn't an option. Finally, the long-awaited sound of helicopter rotors cut through the air. The chopper equipped with high-powered spotlights descended through the thick vegetation, landing in a small clearing to extract us. Risking it all, we scrambled out from hiding positions into the clearing and attempted to board the rescue helicopter. Meanwhile, our rescuers also joined us in taking the last pot shots at the creature. Just as I took one final shot at our pursuer from the helicopter's door, something incredible happened. Along with my shot, several others critically hit, and it finally fell. As its grotesque body hit the forest floor, it appeared as though it were dead or at least dying. Our rescue team wasted no time getting us out of there. We watched from above as the nightmarish scene disappeared beneath us with equal measure relief and bewilderment of what we had experienced. Once back at base camp and given time to process everything, we were debriefed on what exactly transpired there in that forest. Explanations remained muddled even once back in relative safety. Accounts dipped into unanswered suspicions and disbelief over what had occurred. Nothing made complete sense. The grief of losing such loyal members like Jake and Thompson weighed heavily on our hearts as reminders of those gruesome encounters. But it was important to honor their sacrifice by finding explanations that none could quench everyone's thirst for answers fully. No explanation truly sufficed. Alas, against all reason and certainty within our gritty military experiences— we were left grappling with the inconceivable possibility that we may have faced a fearsome species of an unknown origin. The terrible thought lingered with us all. Would it be the last encounter with such a creature? I'm Hank and the moonlit road leading to the isolated cabin in the Blue Ridge Mountains kept me on high alert. My task force had chosen this location as our rendezvous. As part of a special unit focused on hunting and tracking monsters, we knew we were entering dangerous territory. Our liaison, Arvid Rodden, provided information about a creature that had been slaughtering hikers, campers, and even seasoned hunters in the area. As a child, I grew up on a farm and learned the value of hard work, making me an ideal fit for this team. We arrived at the cabin and unpacked our gear. My team consisted of Win Sterling, known for her wit and brutal sarcasm, Gruff Gravely, a quiet brute with an uncanny ability to follow even the faintest tracks, and Daniela Culhane, 
who is quick to catch any inconsistencies or discrepancies in our mission details. Despite my initial skepticism, as we sat around the table discussing recent events in the area, missing persons, unexplained murders, it was hard not to feel a sense of dread closing in. On our third day there, Gruff burst into the cabin with a tattered piece of fabric he found caught on some broken branches. The color matched that of a missing hiker's jacket. Examining the surroundings revealed signs that whoever had been wearing it had been dragged away. Wynne cracked a joke about not wanting to follow that trail, but I could see her visible concern. We grabbed our weapons and gear, and with Gruff leading the way, took off into those ominous woods. As we trudged through the undergrowth, I couldn't help but notice how unusually quiet it was. Usually teeming with wildlife, it was unsettling how absent their sounds were now. A thin fog drifted across the forest floor as we moved further from civilization. Hushed voices formed a web of paranoia. When confessed to finding it difficult to shake off an inevitable feeling of being watched, Daniela's sharp eyes scanned the surroundings, not quite managing to hide her apprehension. We stumbled upon a blood-stained campsite that reeked of violence. Scraps of clothes lay strewn about like ragged confetti, and the partially devoured remains of what was once a person painted a grisly scene. The evidence suggested that the creature was powerful, able to undo this much damage in moments. A series of low growls echoed through the woods, sending shivers down our spines as we readied our weapons. Before I could give the order, Gruff motioned us to take position as the growling intensified. We caught sight of it, an enormous creature with fur matted in blood, eyes blazing like hot coals, terror incarnate. It barreled through our defensive line with staggering force, when barely managed to jump out of its path in time. We backed away from the campsite, forming a tight circle with our weapons at the ready. The creature lunged at us again, but this time Gruff managed to plant a solid blow, sending it reeling back into the shadows. Retreat! I shouted, and we scrambled away from the scene as fast as we could. We didn't know what that thing was or how to stop it, so our best course of action was to put as much distance between us and it as possible. Someone should call for help. When gasped, her breath ragged from running. My signal is dead, Daniela replied, checking her phone. I glanced at mine and found the same problem. No bars. But there's a town nearby, Gruff said. We might be able to reach it if we keep moving. With no other choice available, we pressed on towards that faint glimmer of hope. Along the way, we exchanged whispers about what that creature could be or where it came from. All of us were out of our depths. None of us had any experience in folklore or knowledge about unknown creatures. But one thing was for sure— the extent of its violence and savagery was beyond anything we had ever encountered. As we neared closer to the town, we spotted an ever-increasing trail of destruction, hastily abandoned vehicles and houses torn apart like paper. It seemed that whatever we stumbled upon had already begun wreaking havoc in the area around us. We couldn't afford to waste time. We needed to get help. Finally reaching the town center, we found people huddled together in fear who told us how the creature attacked their homes and killed several people without mercy. They said they'd called for backup but hadn't heard anything since. Deciding to take matters into our own hands, Gruff rallied everyone together while Daniela quickly crafted makeshift defensive barriers around the town using heavy objects. Wynne and I joined the search for useful weapons and supplies to hold off the creature's next attack, assuming it would come. Soon, darkness descended upon us, and we could feel our foe growing nearer, drawn by the scent of fear. We barricaded ourselves in a building near the town's entrance, waiting with bated breaths as the growling intensified. 
In an instant, the creature tore through our fortifications like they were made of paper. It slammed into Gruff, pinning him against the wall. Wynne tried to execute a sneak attack from behind but found herself caught and thrown across the room. It then turned its attention towards Daniela and me as it casually crushed Gruff underfoot. We scrambled back, trying to buy some distance with whatever makeshift weapons we had at hand. Then Daniela struck it with something that made it stagger, a canister of concentrated cleaning chemicals that temporarily blinded it. Seeing our chance, we both leaped over its body as we wrenched Wynne free from where she'd been thrown. The three of us then managed to barely escape its path of destruction as it howled in pain and frustration. As we regrouped outside the town center, bruised and battered, we felt a wave of relief, not because we had managed to chase off the creature but because we could hear distant sirens approaching. Help was finally on its way. Upon their arrival, officials took our statements regarding what happened. An expert on unknown species listened intently as we described the creature, taking note of every detail but offering no answers in return. Our ordeal was over. Still, I found myself unsettled by one last chilling thought. If such a creature could exist in our world without any prior warning or knowledge— how many more unknown horrors might still be lurking out there? I'm Stan, standing ankle-deep in the muddy waters of the Louisiana Bayou, scanning the dense vegetation with my experienced eyes. As a member of the Elite Monster Hunters Task Force— I've seen things most people couldn't even imagine. Some folks might see our line of work as a joke, but after 17 years and countless unsolved cases with horrific findings, I knew the truth. Our small team consisted of myself, Genevieve Dupont, Harlan Knox, and Kendra Sandoval, all seasoned experts in tracking and eliminating monsters. We were on a secret mission to hunt down a vile creature that had been terrorizing the surrounding towns. Locals whispered about a monster lurking in the shadows, leaving behind mutilated bodies and missing loved ones in its wake. The day began with us combing through testimonies from traumatized witnesses to gather any valuable information about this elusive adversary we faced. The stories were eerily similar— these poor townsfolk stumbling upon the remnants of their friends and family members after brutal attacks. The Louisiana heat made every step feel as if I were wading through molasses. Sweat dripped down my forehead when I stumbled upon something that caught my attention. There were strange marks scorched onto a nearby tree trunk something usually associated with our monstrous targets. Their intelligence scares me sometimes— Genevieve whispered, as she picked over the scene with surgeon-like precision. Kendra nodded her agreement, while snapping photos of the oddly shaped burn marks. Harland loudly cracked open a can of soda he had packed for our excursion. Leaning against my rifle for support, I shared minor details about my past, my long-lost brother who went missing on a similar job years ago. Everyone nodded solemnly understanding what it meant to have lost someone like that. The sun dipped beneath the horizon as we continued onwards into darker depths of this swampy territory. We eventually came upon a clearing where we assumed the creature lurked. No sounds of birds, no insects, an eerie silence pervaded. Without warning, Kendra motioned for us to crouch down beside her as she peered through night vision goggles. A screech suddenly shattered the silence of the moonlit bayou. Our hearts raced in our chests as adrenaline rushed through our veins like a river about to burst its banks. A massive, grotesque animalistic being emerged from the shadows, defying our human comprehension of what something animate could look like. Its hulking form stood nearly nine feet tall, with twisted, moss-covered limbs extending in unnatural directions. 
as our task force quickly strategized and prepared ourselves for battle against this abhorrent creature, it became clear that we had underestimated its intelligence and ferocity. It lunged towards us with unnatural speed and bone-chilling howls that pierced the night like silver daggers. We unloaded round after round into its horrendous form while doing our best to stay on our feet as it mercilessly pummeled us with its powerful arms. On several occasions, we tried to radio for backup only to realize that the dense vegetation of the bayou rendered communication impossible. My heart thumped violently in my chest as our team continued grappling with this monster. I knew we were making risky decisions due to this unforeseen circumstance we had encountered head-on during our mission. With every second ticking by as each member of our team became battered and bruised, I planted my feet into the mud, gritted my teeth, and raised my weapon high. It was at this moment when I realized that there could be no turning back someone would inevitably die in this battle against this unspeakable terror lurking within these forsaken Louisiana woods. Realizing the gravity of the situation, I shouted to my team, Retreat! We need to regroup and find a way out. We scrambled in different directions, trying to put as much distance between ourselves and the creature as possible. As we ran through the marshy terrain, I couldn't help but notice the creature seemed focused on one of our teammates, Jen. Its bloodshot eyes locked onto her as it viciously clawed at the air, trying to reach her. Desperation gripped me, and I racked my brain for any possible way to communicate our predicament with headquarters. At last, an idea struck me. The dense swamp vegetation was blocking our radio signals from transmitting far, so what if we could get to higher ground? Directing my team to head towards a tall tree nearby, I helped them begin climbing while simultaneously attempting to fend off the vicious beast. From high up among the branches of the tree, we had at least some sort of temporary reprieve from its relentless pursuit. I knew all too well that this security wouldn't last long the creature had proven its intelligence and persistence already. Using every ounce of strength left in my trembling hands, I climbed to a higher position in the tree and managed to radio our headquarters for an emergency extraction. Mayday! Mayday! This is Task Force Delta. We are in urgent need of immediate evacuation. We're under attack by an unknown hostile being. I frantically repeated the message multiple times until finally receiving a distant but affirmative reply. With an extraction unit on its way, we knew we had little choice but to hold our ground in this precarious position until help arrived. The creature continued to circle around the tree beneath us, snarling and swiping at anyone it could reach. Soon after relaying our desperate situation, adrenaline began wearing off as fatigue crept in. While resting briefly among the branches high above our fearsome enemy, we looked down at the barely visible creature lingering in the shadows below. Jen had sustained several deep wounds during the escape and was now struggling to keep conscious. It didn't take long for all of us to share a profoundly haunting realization if we couldn't fend off the beast until backup arrived. Jen might not make it out alive. With no other options available, we had to create an opportunity for escape. Cooperating together as a team once more, we crafted makeshift weapons from branches and stones, hoping they would be enough to slow the creature down temporarily. Our plan went into motion as we began hurling our improvised projectiles at the hideous creature below us. The effective distraction caused the beast to recoil in pain and, more importantly, confusion. Seizing this small window of opportunity, we quickly descended from the tree and made a final dash for safer ground. As the creature pursued us with renewed vigor, our rescue helicopter appeared on the horizon our last hope in this perilous situation. Landing just a short distance away on a small patch of solid ground amidst the swampy morass, 
Our team scrambled aboard the aircraft as its powerful rotors struggled against the thick swamp air to lift us back into safety. The creature howled furiously after us but could not follow any further as we ascended high above its grasp. As our helicopter whisked us away from that nightmarish swamp, I took one final look at the creature's menacing figure receding into darkness beneath us. The beast's motivations and origins remained shrouded in mystery just like itself a horrifying secret lurking within that dreadful Louisiana bayou. I'm Sam Jenkins, a determined hunter working for an elite task force. Today, I find myself at the edge of the ominous Aokigahara Forest in Japan. Locals call this the Sea of Trees. Dense, dark, and unnerving, people often come here, never to be seen again. We'd received intel about suspicious activities here. As we proceed into the suffocating woods... My colleague Eleanor Caucasian shares her concerns. Sam, what do we really know about this thing we're hunting? I chuckle lightly before answering. I had a pet turtle when I was eight. His name was Benny. How's that for personal background? She lets out a reluctant laugh. Following markings on trees and strange tracks on the ground, we delve deeper into Aokigahara our hearts beating faster and breathing becoming heavier as tension mounts. The dense foliage hinders our visibility. Despite lacking solid information about our quarry, we remain undaunted. Our objective, locate and neutralize an unknown creature wreaking havoc in these woods. This monster has claimed lives through mauling, burning, and other unorthodox means— yet its identity remains a mystery. As night envelopes us under the moonlit canopy, Abdullay Fofana and Irina Kachenko get separated from the team. We yell for our lost teammates. However, they ominously refrain from answering. Inching forward cautiously, Eleanor spots something tangled in tall grass, an arm or a leg perhaps. Shaking yet curious, she leans down to investigate. Suddenly, she recoils with horror as the severed limb reveals brutal bite marks. While examining the morbid discovery with trembling hands, we sense a presence hidden behind gnarled trunks. Blinking in disbelief at its terrifying form, broad muscular shoulders draped in tattered cloth and gaping jaws filled with serrated teeth, its inhuman eyes fixate on us. Eleanor raises her firearm to shoot, but the creature lunges with impossible speed. Yelling at the top of her lungs, she calls for Abdullah and Irina to help, only for her scream to be cut off into a painful gasp as the monstrous being grasps her throat. I attempt to rescue her by drawing my gun and firing a shot, but the beast merely scoffs as I stand no chance against its abhorrent strength. Relinquishing its grip, Eleanor crumbles lifelessly to the ground. Our fears materialize. What lurks within Aokigahara is far from human, a terrifying predator with relentless hunger. Grief-stricken, we call headquarters for backup, knowing that we may never escape these cursed woods. As if sensing our fear, the creature's guttural growl echoes through the thicket, a storm brewing in nightmarish tension. Regaining our footing, I plan an improvised trap using my ingenuity, despite knowing that this may result in sacrifice. We lure it into a clearing, baiting with objects it seems to find irresistible. Abdullay, Irina, and I regroup after setting up the trap. Our faces display a mix of terror and determination as we ready ourselves for a final confrontation with the creature. We huddle together, weapons in hand, waiting for our foe to take the bait. Whispers emanate from deep within the forest, growing increasingly louder. The sound is unmistakable the creature is coming. The plan goes into motion as we watch it step into the clearing. 
As it reaches the scattered items, Irina kicks over a bucket of nails, sending sharp projectiles flying towards it. The creature shrieks in pain but continues its ruthless pursuit. Abdullah then lights a makeshift Molotov cocktail and hurls it at the monster with full force. It explodes upon impact, engulfing the abomination in flames. Our hopes rise momentarily before reality sinks in, the monstrous being doesn't seem phased. It charges at us, fury in those piercing eyes apparent. I call out to Abdullah and Irina to split up while firing off several shots aimed at its legs, hoping to slow its advance. It stumbles but quickly regains balance. We sprint through the dense trees, but Abdullah's foot catches on a root, causing him to trip and fall to the ground. Without hesitation, Irina pauses and reaches down to pull him up despite risking their lives. Their loyalty astounds me. As they regain their footing and disappear deeper into a Akigahara forest, I realize that they've successfully drawn the creature away from me, giving me precious time. There's only one thing left for me to do, call for help. Dialing headquarters once again, I demand immediate extraction as I detail our perilous situation, Eleanor's death and our newfound monstrous enemy. The operator acknowledges my urgency and promises that help will be on the way as soon as they can mobilize a team. I turn back towards the trap, still trying to comprehend this vicious being that brought death and devastation to our lives. In an attempt to piece together its origin, I recall several news articles about cases of illegal genetic experimentation in the region. Such research could have given birth to this nightmare, an amalgamation of human-like features and predatory instincts, the epitome of malevolence. In the still of the night, a helicopter roars overhead, drowning out thought and fear alike. The rectangle of light cast by its searchlight swipes through the forest until it finds me. As I signal back with my flashlight, my heart flutters with relief. They've arrived. In what feels like an eternity, uniformed officials swarm the scene. Some aid Abdullah and Irina while others investigate Eleanor's body with solemn reverence. The rest consult with us on our experience before launching an intense hunt for the creature. They refuse to divulge specific details but assure us that action will be taken to neutralize this threat once they understand its origin, ensuring that no one will suffer at its hands again. Eleanor's sacrifice weighs heavily on our conscience as we leave Ea Kigahara. The reach of her spirit extends far beyond her untimely death. She will forever remain a guiding force in our lives both individually and collectively. Though we stood in the face of terror, it was ultimately our friendship and collaboration that preserved hope for humanity against an unknown menace. How we choose to proceed in uncertain times will shape not only our individual destinies but also our collective future, a sobering testament to the power wielded by unity, hope, and unwavering loyalty among friends. And so we move onward, carrying Eleanor within us always ready and determined to confront any challenge that befalls us in this unforgiving world. Our bond, now tempered by loss, promises to uphold the enduring spirit of determination that is the true essence of humanity. I'm Jackson Whitaker sitting on a worn-out bench in Montville Park, birds chirping and children laughing around me. I worked for a secret task force specializing in hunting and tracking monsters, a job that always kept me on my toes. We had gathered for what seemed like another mission briefing near Montville, a small town surrounded by dense woods, where several incidents occurred that remained inexplicable. Anita Reynolds, our team leader with her ever-present stern expression, handed me a classified dossier. Jackson, our target is this creature. 
She motions at an artist's rendering of an amalgamation of twisted limbs and malice-filled eyes. It has been terrorizing the people in these woods, and it's time to put an end to it. We need to find it before it claims more victims. As we started our search in the woods, I couldn't help but notice the fear and determination evident in each member of my team. Despite our varying backgrounds, mine comes from a family of fishermen. We were united in dealing with lethal threats against humanity. We split into groups to cover more ground. My partner was Frank Murphy, stocky build and experienced marksman who never held back his personality like now when he cracked jokes while crouching among the underbrush. How do you suppose this creature looks when it shaves? He said with a laugh that didn't match the direness of our situation. During our slow but methodical search through the woods, we came across several odd occurrences. Broken branches sixty feet high dangling like grotesque chandeliers above us. Footprints that morphed from human to animal as if growing off human forms. The stakes became more personal when we discovered Alice Carroll's body, a missing woman from town, disfigured beyond recognition. As we rushed back to inform our team about the chilling discovery, we were halted not long after by something towering over us, a colossal figure with piercing eyes inflicting throbbing pain through our minds. The agonizing sensation was over before we knew it, leaving us on edge. Jackson, we need to take this thing down, whispered Frank as he loaded fresh clips into his firearm, his usual demeanor glanced by the grim reality of the mission. Later in the night, we found evidence of a skirmish between members of another monster hunting team and the creature. Chilling but precise slashes painted a foreboding image of just how dangerous and intelligent it was. Scattered ammunition boxes were left behind, a testimony to their struggle. Together with our task force, we devised a plan to corner the creature in a remote part of the woods, using bait to lure it into our trap. Time seemed to stand still as we waited for its arrival. Each second felt like an eternity. The minutes that followed were lined with terror. A blood-curdling screech pierced the air and foreshadowed doom. Gunshots echoed around us while trees splintered in its wrath. It bore the form of an abomination, something pulled from a collective nightmare, tendrils reaching out from its twisted torso as if hungering for sustenance. I grabbed Frank by the arm and whispered, We have to call for backup. It's just too strong for the two of us. Frank hesitated and replied, I don't know if we can risk putting anyone else in danger. We agreed to this when we took on the task force, and I'm not sure we want to explain Alice's situation to her family. They don't need to see what happened to her. The creature, a towering mass of twisted flesh and sinew, charged towards us with blinding speed screaming as it went. It tore through our makeshift barricade with ease, knocking down trees as it did so. As it lunged at us, tendrils whipped out from its sides and wrapped around Jackson's throat. He struggled against them as Frank attempted to shoot them off him. We can't do this alone! I yelled in desperation while making a break for safety. In a blind panic, I found a secluded spot and called for reinforcements on my radio. I informed them of our location and the situation with the creature attack on Alice. Reinforcements arrived in record time. A blur of black uniforms and heavy artillery suffused over the area. Knowing my team was in capable hands, I decided to retreat as they bravely engaged with the terrorizing creature. The sound of gunfire rang in my ears while hiding low behind a tree. However, despite their energetic efforts, one member of our backup team was killed during the confrontation. The creature repeatedly confronted us for what felt like hours until finally subdued by sheer brute force and firepower. With the creature successfully driven back and injured from countless bullet holes littering its misshapen body, 
it appeared to recede into retreat within the forest depths. We assessed our surroundings with trepidation still weighing upon our hearts, acknowledging that we were fortunate to have called for help despite Frank's concerns initially. We stood at the scene of the ferocious battle, bloodied and utterly exhausted. The slain task force member's lifeless body reminded us of the ultimate price we had paid to restrain this creature. Let's wrap things up here and take Alice home, Frank said somberly. We collected Carol's remains and headed back towards our vehicles. Alice's husband met us when we returned to town. His sorrowful expression spoke volumes. We took care to distance ourselves from her shattered form, unable to provide solace or answers for what happened to her. Later on, while documenting this harrowing event, I found myself making attempts to understand the creature better. It was apparent that no documentation in the realm of nature could explain its origin, a twisted species unknown even to folklore or legend. Nevertheless, it made me question what we were truly up against and how much intervention is required in order not only to keep us safe but also defend those we care for. As I reflected on all this, I also thought about our fallen comrade, his name now etched among those who elegantly danced with demons that lurk within the darkest corners of reality. His life would serve as a testament to our dedication in eliminating any lurking terrors waiting for their moment upon the faces of innocence, a living memory carried forth by those who witnessed and fought alongside him. In the end, our mission could be deemed successful by most standards. We had driven off a seemingly invincible creature and suffered only minimal loss, albeit at the cost of Alice and one valiant team member. As we continued our endeavor in combating these bewildering entities, I made a vow to never forget the trial faced on that terrifying day. To always seek help when required and fight relentless against forces that may threaten humanity's peace. I'm Reginald McCabe, and the dense forest of Epping in Essex, England was where it all began. My colleagues, Esme Ridgway and Barnabas McCourt, joined me as we embarked on a secret mission for our task force that specialized in hunting and tracking monsters. We had received word of a mysterious creature roaming deep within the woods, terrorizing innocent people. Many locals had gone missing lately and we were supposed to investigate. As we ventured deeper into the forest, the ominous atmosphere grew with each step we took. As the team leader, I joked about how this mission reminded me of some messy college pranks my mates and I used to pull to lighten our mood. However, under the humor lied the lingering anxiety that intensified as we ventured further. While exploring the woods, we came across a gruesome scene, a horrifyingly mutilated corpse with bite marks that indicated something predatory. We were shocked by the brutality of the attack. This was no ordinary creature. After observing the body carefully and analytically for clues about our antagonist, all three of us decided to split up to cover more ground. As the experienced hunter, I carried my trusted firearm while my partners carried theirs. Walking alone through the dark woods was nerve-wracking. While patrolling cautiously through the dense foliage, I heard abrupt rustling nearby. Instantly tense, I crept towards it, my flashlight illuminating a deer entangled in barbed wire, alive but struggling with fear in its eyes. Pity filled me, but we had our mission at hand I couldn't afford any distractions. Then I saw something that made my heart jump. A massive figure loomed nearby with claws tearing into other trees. Initially skeptical as to what I saw being real or paranoia-induced hallucinations due to stress development for being out in these rugged terrains long hours on this looming case, yet my gut told me there could have been possible credibility in what I had just witnessed. 
Realizing I needed backup, I tried to call Esme and Barnabas on our intercom, but there was no signal deep in the woods. Panic surged as I recalled our meeting point, hoping that sprinting towards it would reconnect me with them. Upon arrival, I found Esme waiting, eyes wide with terror from discovering another mutilated victim. Barnabas complained about losing her radio contact earlier. However, we couldn't afford to linger. We had a creature still stalking in darkness nearby. There wasn't any time remaining for us in waiting around providing further opportunity for an ambush. Describing the beast I encountered to them, the monstrous height, bulky build, thick fur with muscle bursting beneath it, I knew we were to deal with something far more dangerous than we initially anticipated. The trio of us continued further into the woods, hunting this mysterious creature whose existence should not have been credible but was now an imminent threat that must be stopped-slash-mitigated at all costs. As the forest's darkness swallowed us completely while wandering deeper into its moss searching tirelessly for clues regarding this unknown perilous antagonist, unease grew amongst us. We were interrupted by a blood-curdling scream echoing across crashed trees snapping under an unseen force spurring forth dread like wildfire inside each one of us. Fear clawed at our throats as we raced toward its source. A horrifying sight lay before us. Barnabas sprung into action pulling out his firearm preparing his position, while Esme did likewise transitioning into a tactical stance aiming down the sight of her weapon leveling at the entrance point to where they expected the menace may strike first. We moved cautiously, keeping our eyes on the surrounding area where the creature could be hiding. We couldn't call for backup because we were deep in the woods where cell reception was non-existent. We knew that we must make do with just the three of us if we were to have any chance of survival. I remembered how just a few days ago I stumbled upon the mutilated remains of a hiker while doing my job as a park ranger. It was a gruesome sight, unlike anything I had ever seen before. That's when I requested backup from my colleagues, Esme and Barnabas, who both had experience with these sorts of incidents. Suddenly, we heard rustling from nearby bushes. With our weapons drawn, we prepared ourselves for whatever would come our way. Out of the thick vegetation, the creature emerged. It was massive and terrifying, standing on two legs with razor-sharp claws protruding from its hands. The beast had toned muscles visible beneath its fur-covered body, and its teeth were like saws covered in fresh blood. Barnabas quickly fired off several rounds from his gun towards the creature, but they seemed to have no effect on it. Esme shouted over to me that she had reported an unknown animal attack to local authorities who sent wildlife experts as quickly as they could to our location. As Barnabas focused on shooting the beast, it suddenly lunged towards him and grabbed him with immense strength, tearing him apart. I watched my colleague lose his life brutally before my eyes. I felt helpless and terrified at what was happening. Esme continued firing at the creature while I realized that shooting wasn't going to work. We needed another plan. As she attempted to distract it with her gunfire, I looked around for anything that could help us escape or fend off the beast. My eyes landed on a fallen tree branch nearby that looked sturdy enough for me to use as a weapon. I rushed to it, grabbed it, and then swung at the creature with all my strength. To my surprise, the branch made contact with the beast's torso, and it screeched in pain. It seemed disoriented by the sudden attack allowing Esme to land a shot directly through its eye. The creature stumbled backward and fell to the ground lifeless. We stood there, breathless, trying to process what had just happened. It felt like a nightmare we couldn't wake up from. We only managed to kill this mysterious and brutal creature by pure luck and self-defense on our parts. As May approached me, and we immediately started making our way back to where we had parked our vehicles, 
We knew better than to stick around for any longer. As we walked silently through the dark forest, I glanced over at Esme's face. I could see her fighting back tears as she thought about Barnabas. When we finally reached our vehicles and took a moment to catch our breaths, Esme said that she would keep me informed about what the wildlife experts discovered. We didn't know if there were more creatures out there or what had caused this one in particular to become so brutal. In the following days, I found out from Esme that the creature had been identified as a mutated bear of some kind. The wildlife experts conducted tests on its remains and discovered traces of unique bacteria in its blood that suggest exposure to an unknown toxin which had transformed it into the monstrous being that we encountered. Yet despite having answers about what the creature was, it felt like little consolation for Barnabas' death. We both couldn't shake off the horror of what happened in those woods. Others needed to be warned of potential dangers lurking deep in the darkness of nature. One moment someone is innocently hiking or working as a park ranger. Next thing they know, their lives are taken away in brutally gruesome ways. But we both knew, as we continued our work, what happened in those woods would stay with us for the rest of our lives. We could only hope that no one else would have to face such an unspeakable atrocity again.